Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. It is 10 to 8, well before the appointed time, but we're just going to run a uh, countdown up until the 8 o'clock mark. So if you're watching the recording of this, skip along the timeline to the 8-minute mark, and we'll see you there. OK, let's run. Hey, run a countdown, yes. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, I have the strange thing of uh, not being able. To, have, have, have they moved um, pop out chat? Um, no, it should be under the three dots. Um, uh, three dots and something. Good evening, Warrior Steve. <clears throat> Looking forward to another interesting encounter. Us too. <laughs> Dave, Dave, hello there. Uh, good evening you up there in uh, in manchester have you sorted yourself out rupert uh, no i it's uh, i'm just going to do it on the other machine so uh, okay. no okay as long as you know quite you strange do. this evening uh, mm -hmm. well yeah okay. smoke and mirrors well it was all strange <laughs> and we still until we <clears throat> started trying to um make things work and then things refused to work Yes, Alison, it's been one of those to you too. Days, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish you luck with your duvet cover. <clears throat> hi, Nick. Uh, hi, Francis. Um, welcome. Um, so that's an interesting point. I don't know if we know Francis uh, from from before, um, but I I expect. I mean, I fingers crossed. I don't know whether we'll get you know more than usual number as a folk tonight. I mean, we'll talk about it later, but with the yes. numbers coming from um, uh, the boosted numbers coming from the Bontra Plutala uh, video, I'm just wondering uh, <clears throat> what sort of an audience we'll get. We'll get a friendly audience because they always are. Hello, Spike. We always um, have a friendly audience. Here's Helen and there's Stuart and Nigel. <clears throat> oh, who's watching us on the train? I've Hello, been visiting folks. the Knossos <laughs> exhibition in Oxford, as recommended by. Well, I hope um, the recommended. I hope the recommendation was a was a good one. We certainly um, enjoyed it. I hope you had time also, because there's a lot of stuff that was already in the Ashmolean. Um, uh, uh, in addition to what's in the uh, Knossos uh, exhibition as well, uh, you know, aside from the marvelous. Um, uh, rest of the exhibition at the Ashmolean. So I hope you had uh, time in your visit to enjoy a lot of that stuff as well, Nigel. Anyway, you're very welcome. Uh, anyway, uh, shall I scroll down? Have you sorted yourself out now, uh, Rupert? I'm, uh, I'm actually transferring link cross machines. So uh, I don't know why tech is being the way it is this evening, but never mind. Well, it's nothing to last night. This time last, uh, last month, you weren't here. Nobody was That's here. True I was too. all on my own That's trying true to too. sort things out. Do you know so what? It's, step up. It's, it's crazy, folks. I mean, it, you, the vagaries of tech that we're using exactly the same link to connect this evening as we had last time. And last time, just I wasn't there. Anthony wasn't there. Mike was sitting there on his own, panicking quietly. Uh, <laughs> it's too strange. I don't know what happens in the ether <clears> sometimes. <clears throat> Hi there, Carol. Hello, Jeff. Jill from Queensland, where it's 5 a.m. Wow. I hope you haven't stayed up late or got up early, especially to watch this. No, you can't. Do that. Seriously, have you? That would be <laughs> madness. Uh, <laughs> ben, hi there. That's Simon. Lala, Lala C from uh, southwest uh, Georgia. I don't think you've seen Hello. me before. Um, if no. not, uh, welcome. Kipple, I think we've seen before. Jim. Um, uh, Steve-o. Um, excellent. And uh, Cro Chromeco83. I think I recognize the tag. Jill. Hello there. And Jorman. Um, Got you know, up so. early. Jill. Well, mm -hmm. well. Uh, Hi, Les. Well, let, let's hope we make hello, it hello. as well. I'm so impressed. 
indeed. So, uh, uh, yes. what we got in store? Are you okay? Are you sorted uh, now? I am sorted. Excellent. Excellent. I, I am sorted. Yes, the tech is now behaving. I think. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, five minutes into the countdown. Hello, Graham. Welcome. Yvonne, hello there. Yeah, hi, Graham. Yvonne from British Columbia. Fantastic. Well, you're very welcome, Yvonne. Yeah, thanks. And uh, uh, Richard, Susanna, M Maria, Emmanuel reveals the truth about Stonehenge. Okay, can't wait. <laughs> Are we. <laughs> And uh, talking of Stonehenge, our special guest this evening, of course, uh, is uh, Jennifer Wexler, who is uh, properties, uh, Senior Properties Manager at English Heritage, which means that uh, in large part she's quite in charge of Stonehenge, and, <laughs> as well as uh, Indeed. other things, yeah, herself. Uh, 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 and we've yeah, apparently uh, got, got the reverse polarity of the neutron flow. That explains everything. <laughs> 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 uh, yes. Uh, three two um, five studio. Hello, Greg. You're welcome. So we, we've got an um, yeah. interesting mix of uh, of stuff tonight, and uh, we, we have promised, we have actually um, we promised to take more, uh, um, pay more attention to our guests. I think we, I think we sort of <laughs> yeah because because you know is I'll say in our defence, um, a, a few people commented last time that we we didn't let Anthony uh, enough, and and the trouble is, Anthony's a good friend of ours, and you just kind of take it for granted, really, when you've got you've got a mate sitting uh, with you, essentially, yeah. and we just all chat. And Anthony he was very happily just sitting there listening to us, the fool. And, and we we didn't we didn't make a point because we just knew each other so well. We didn't make a point to say what are you up to, Anthony? And we should have done. So we apologise to any of you uh, Anthony fans and were disappointed in that. Uh, yeah. We'll make it up to you in due course, and we'll make it up to Anthony. Uh, well, we're seeing him in September anyway. Yeah. The Fletch, because you know, when I, we go to I, Ireland. Um, I don't know what it is, Rupert, but your your audio is a bit flaky, and I don't think there's anything we can do about it at this. Uh, 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 is that, it? It's, How it, flaky it is, is it? it? It's not that microphone. It? It's 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 the connection. It sounds weak. Um, uh, bit, well, uh, I'm on four. I can't do it on that. Nothing we can do about it. It just sounds, sounds a bit weird. That's all. Never mind. Right. We've got uh, an, a nice collection of, uh, of stuff to uh, get through tonight. Um, I hope you'll find it um, really uh, fascinating. Hello, Bonnie. We, yes, we uh, yeah, everything's all right, I think. Um, <laughs> who are you happy birthdaying, Jill? Happy birthday to who? Kate. Apparently it's Kate's birthday. Oh, yeah, you all. It's her oh, birthday, no. Kate. Happy birthday. Fabulous. Happy birthday. You should be out partying. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is the celebration. <laughs> Who knows? Um, no, what we ha we have, we've got a good mix tonight, haven't we? We've uh, before we, we you know, try to tell you before we go live. Look, um, mm. uh, uh, we're uh, we're uh, bouncing around the Middle East again. Um, Where's the furthest we're going this week? Month. Furthest, uh, furthest uh, east. Um, that'll be the um, uh, the Baltic Amber in Ashur. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi there, Kate. And Riss. You've Hello, done your good evening. bike ride. Welcome. Wow. Okay. Hello, Riss. <laughs> Hello. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, do you know what? I'm so impressed, uh, and uh, and uh, and it warms the cockles of my heart that, uh, that some of you have joined us at the most ridiculous time of time. day or night. Yeah, um, we're a, we get quite overwhelmed, don't we? To think, uh, <laughs> we do, we do. 
for taking the time. Um, and yet we do our best to make sure that the, a lot of people do. It's a, it's a strange uh, opposition. It's a strange thing. Anyway, five, four, three, two, one. Hello, good evening, welcome everybody, welcome everybody that's new to the channel, welcome everybody that um, are good friends we can see in the chat already, um, you're very welcome tonight, Rupert's, <laughs> true to form, <laughs> Rupert's gone totally fuzzy. <laughs> I have but, gone very fuzzy, I don't know why, I can't be on, I can't make the connection any stronger than it is, I can only apologise. For my fuzziness, so long as you, your so long as you can sound hear me, has right. clean, your sound has cleaned up very nicely. So at least we can uh, hear Praise you um, properly. Really looking forward to, to tonight, as we probably as we've mentioned, definitely our special guest tonight is uh, Dr. Jennifer Wexler, who was uh, senior cur cur curator of the um, Stonehenge, uh, World of Stonehenge exhibition at the British Museum uh, last year, which um, I went to twice. Or did we go to it twice? Anyway. No, I went to it once. You went to it twice. Yeah. Um, uh, Jennifer yeah. did a fantastic uh, job uh, on that. Uh, now, uh, latterly, she has moved to English Heritage, where she is mm. uh, senior manager, uh, senior project senior properties manager uh which means under stonehenge itself and, and stuff uh, uh come under her auspice grimes graves and, and things like that so still waiting yeah. her arrival in the green room so fingers crossed yes <laughs> she's not, uh, so we, we, uh, stuck we were somewhere. sitting with her yesterday just to make sure that all the tech was working fine mm -hmm. uh the thing is jennifer is on, uh, is going to a conference tomorrow that we're not going to this year but um mm. uh so she's actually joining us from a hotel and uh, <laughs> we certainly know when we were talking to her yesterday that everything was uh, uh, was on target so we're hoping she hasn't got a problem where she is time yeah. will tell anyway before jennifer arrives and uh, before we get started properly don't worry about being late, uh, hyper bum fuzzle. Uh, very good to see you. We let's go. I it's such agree. a good tag. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. A, f a few things to sort of chat about before. One thing that's blown our socks off has been um, the response um, to um, the latest uh, video of ours. Uh, what was it published uh, two weeks ago? If that, I can't remember now. Uh, track of time. <clears throat> yeah, it's not far off. That something like that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's uh, about uh, um, Bonjour Clutala, a, a sort of arrival to Gebekli Tepe down there in um, southeast uh, Turkey. Uh, and as of this moment, it may already have done it. It uh, certainly was approaching the three hundred thousand views mark. Is it uh, which has blown any of our previous records out of the water as far as um, uh, his Jennifer. I'll just let her into the green room while we uh, continue talking. Rupert, you say some words while I make sure. Um, uh, it, uh, I'll just tell you that it has gone over the 300,000 mark. Three, it's 300. Oh, really? At point seven thousand. Right. Views. I'm just going yes. to wave to Jennifer so that she can. Excellent. So uh, I'll tell you. Yes. So right, we, we don't know back. why. Uh, we just. Uh, mm. um, uh, so it, it clearly hit the nerve uh, for whatever reason. Anyway, and our uh, subscribers coming on board and all the rest of it, it's just it, uh, took off over the last uh, couple of weeks, um, yeah. which is, you know, it's uh, wonderful. It's very exciting for us anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, if any of you uh, uh, here with us already have, uh, have have found us because of that, then uh, welcome uh, and yes. thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, what else do we want to say? Um, uh, well, just recently, um, uh, God, it seems such a long time ago already, but it was only last week that I was down with you in uh, uh, in your home down in the south know, of France. It, it it seems like months ago. You're right. Yeah, it weird, was. Uh, like a week or so yeah yeah mm. 
Uh, and a fine time we had, didn't we? Well, Even though it was not the best weather that we've ever had. <laughs> well, I was a very productive time we had because our minds are very much focused, although it's, you know, some time uh, in the distance. Um, but, uh, you know, good folks have thrown good money at us to um, uh, kick our uh, Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge project off. And so we needed to get the energy flowing with that and make sure that we had a, a proper plan in place um, and uh, all being we'll talk actually we'll talk more about that uh, later during the middle of the show um, but um, yeah we've got good plans in place for the first episode uh, of Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge and we expect to be filming in uh, early November this year yeah 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 um, yep, yep. Uh, and uh, we'll tell you a bit more about that uh, that later. Uh, interestingly, we have actually reached the um, financial goal for getting us down there, uh, and any um, additional funds going to that project is now rolling over to funding the second episode. So yippee, that's another sort of milestone uh, covered. Yes. And thank you, you know, if there are anybody if there are folk in the audience here who have helped to, to make that possible. As I say... You know we'll who you are, bit, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk a bit um, later in the show uh, in more detail about that. And the mm. other thing, of course, is to talk about our Patreon folk. Uh, a large number of people I see in the chat already, but if you're new to the show, um, please do consider supporting us through Patreon. Now we can advertise all the kind of bells and well, the you know the the benefits of of Patreon about being on the inside track of what we're up to and getting your own month weekly uh, podcast and getting the monthly Zoom call and getting ad free videos. But what struck us uh, a couple of weeks ago is, heck, we've been doing this quite a long time. So not only do you get those benefits, but you get this massive archive of of, of stuff. Yeah. If you, so if you can't get enough of us, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Patreon's the place uh, yes. to be. There's, if, there's over if you 400... can't get enough of us, God help you. But um, yeah, but yeah there's, how much is there? There, there's tons of stuff. Hundreds. There's four hundred, four hundred and seventy items that you can't get elsewhere. Exclusive items, and there's you know mm. what, nearly one hundred and fifty uh, exclusive podcasts, and the odd uh, you know quite a few other things as well. Uh, all the ad-free videos, uh, you know. Ima imagine YouTube yeah. without ads. Well, you can watch yeah. our YouTube stuff with, uh, sans yeah. ads uh, on Patreon. So, so well over a hundred podcasts that could help you fall asleep at night. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Links in the description <laughs> below. That's enough of that. We've, we've made the pitch. I think uh, with that, unless you can think of anything else, Rupert, I think it's time to uh, bring our lovely guest into... Uh, bring into Jennifer show. on, yeah. Uh, indeed. I'll tell you what, I mean, Bill, before we do, um, there, um, we need to say a few words. I, I think during the countdown I said a few words about Jennifer, and we first came across Jennifer met her, you know, when uh, it was a kind of surprise thing, really, because... Um, we were invited along to uh, the Stonehenge exhibition, and uh, we yeah. first met Jennifer at the British uh, British Museum. Um, as far as her background is concerned, I think we'll save that to when we've got got you on, Jennifer. Is that, a, that okay? Um, but uh, yeah, Jennifer is now, as it says on the screen, senior properties manager at Stone at um, English Heritage, which uh, for which Stonehenge, Thornborough Henges, and and Grimes Graves, among others, come under her auspice. But I know there's a wealth of background that's led up to uh, this position. Um, so you know, maybe we'll talk about that. So um, right, uh, let me bring. Jennifer into uh yay there Ta -da! <laughs> hello, hello. hello. You're very welcome in your hotel How you room how, how, in how's Cambridge. the hotel yeah no it's good can you can you see and hear me okay perfect see and hear yeah. perfectly yeah great yes yeah <laughs> 
So didn't do a, a complete, a full-blown introduction there. It didn't cover all the bases, you know. I mean, for example, the tenure, uh, time at the Horniman Museum in South London that, uh, I mean, some people may know about the Horniman Museum, uh, and oh, uh, in the field activities in the Mediterranean, uh, on Sicily in particular, am I right? That's is in correct. Your, is in your history, yeah. Um, but where to begin? I mean, I, we'd better let you introduce yourself a bit and say, you know, a, a yeah, bit yeah. how you got into archaeology and you know what got you here and a little bit about your your journey to English heritage and the British Museum. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. It's it's My lovely pleasure. to see you both. And um, it is our pleasure to see you again. <laughs> um, it, it's been an interesting journey. I, I think I'm, I'm one of those strange people who wanted to be an archaeologist since I was quite young and, and sort of went out. I, I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, so I, I went behind my school after school with a friend of mine and we would go dig up fossils. Um, and this was, you know, when I was like about, I don't know, seven or eight. So my parents thought I would grow out yeah. of it. Um, but <laughs> obviously it didn't quite work out like that. Um, but prehistory was a, a slightly different one because, you know, I had that classic thing that most kids have, you know, obsessed with sort of Egypt and, you know, ancient Mediterranean cultures. And it wasn't till I went on a dig when I was uh, 17 to Ireland and I saw all these amazing prehistoric monuments everywhere in the southern, in southwest Ireland. And I thought, what are these things? I don't, I've never heard about any of these things, you know, these standing stones and ring forts and circles and and I just got really captivated. And I also started reading a lot of um, Irish mythology around that time. So obviously there's a lot of kind of, you know, um, sort of folk history on these sites, which I found really fascinating. Um, and I, I just kind of never really got over it <laughs> in a way. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, it's something I just continued to pursue even as I studied. Um, I, I kind of still was looking into Egyptian stuff and then I sort of crossed, crossed the line and went into sort of, Iron Age Cornwall, and there's no looking back after that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did, did you have that thing of digging in the, digging in the garden, you know, fossils, you know, uh, with the faint expectation in the back of your mind that you might just find a brontosaurus? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, possibly. I mean, in, you know, in California, it wasn't, well, you know, actually, one of the places I was really fascinated with as a child is um, they have these this place called the La Brea Tar Pits, yes. which is pretty weird. You know, it's it's literally a pit of tar and they found, you know, hundreds or if not thousands of animal bones there from, you know, different periods of time. And so as a child, yeah. I was really obsessed with this. And it's right next to where the Natural History Museum is in L.A. Oh, right. And I think they also did like little little um, digs and stuff. So. I remember I forced my parents to become members of the Natural History Museum because they had a dinosaur ball. And I thought that was the best thing ever. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> you know, not necessarily realizing the difference at the time between sort of archaeology and paleontology. But yeah. Um, so and and I, you know, I guess what happened is after I got really interested in prehistory, I, I decided to come here essentially to, to do my graduate degrees. So master's and, and PhD and and really kind of look into the archaeology of Britain. Um, and also, I worked in Sicily for my PhD, which was essentially the idea there was um, because I kind of wanted to go a little bit back into my Mediterranean roots, but use sort of a, a landscape archaeology methodology that, <clears throat> you know, is so well established in British context, but not necessarily mm -hmm. in other places. And also, Sicily has a really interesting prehistory that is un understudied in the sense because it has such an amazing classical culture so yeah. it was it has you know mm. megalithic tombs and things like that so i really kind of wanted to, to sort of use almost like a british style um, study um so i have a background in kind of landscapes and monuments i guess you could say which is which is great for my current job yeah it's great from our point yeah. of view as well because it gives us a, a, yet another uh, wonderful sounding board. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We we will be coming back to you about uh, the Sicily and uh, things. Yeah, go off on one. <laughs> yeah. So so um, so that's the um, uh, you know PhD. So when you left uh, university, when was your first um, established um, uh, position, as it were? 
Yeah. So I also um, had a bit of a museum background from the States. Um, I worked mm. at the Natural History Museum in New York City and I always, it's, it's strange. I, I kind of always had these two sides where I loved the kind of museums and archives and things like that, but yeah. also loved um, landscapes and, and field archaeology. Um, so it was always kind of trying to balance those out. And when I did my PhD, I realized that um, just from a job perspective and an experience perspective, um, it would be really good to get a experience of, of doing um, like a, a like a hardcore kind of funerary assemblage analysis. And um, I ended up getting a little bit of funding to do a project at the British Museum. Um, and actually that was kind of the start of my my work at the british museum um so that was looking at an archive collection of um from an, a bronze age barrow in uh in norfolk near kingsland and oh, okay. a sort of lost collection that kind of got a yeah. bit abandoned during it was excavated right before the start of world war ii so it kind of it was a little bit of a detective story and actually it was really interesting it was it's the site's called roughly wood um it's interesting because all this material came in, but basically we have a series of letters between Christopher Hawks, who was, you know, the assistant keeper at that time in, in um, sort of the Department of Ancient Antiquities or whatever it was called at that time. Um, and the, the excavators who were essentially kind of, um, you know, knowledgeable amateurs. And it was quite funny because basically Christopher Hawks was, you know, sort of armchair, um, you know, directing these excavations in the late 1930s, it was 1938, um, from his office at the British Museum and kind of telling them what to do. And they were doing things like sending him drawings and he was interpreting them for him, which is a very kind of Christopher Hawks thing to do. And then he was saying, oh, you need to send us all the best finds, obviously. Um, <laughs> and they, you know, and they, and they did. Um, so the whole collection came to the, to the BM, but and it even got put on display for a short period of time um, until sort of the war really, um, you know, kind of set in and everything, a lot of things obviously got put in storage. And there was objects that become, became lost, including, including a massive um, collared urn. Um, so a kind of late early Bronze Age burial urn. Um, and we had lots of cremations and things as well to sort through and and pottery, lots. Of, it, it's, it was essentially a, a later early Bronze Age site built on top of a beaker settlement, which mm. beaker settlements are pretty rare. Right. So it's, it's an important yeah. site. Um, and, uh, uh, but this urn went missing and it was one day, I remember it was, it was kind of one of those like moments, you know, uh, they were, they were unboxing and, and sort of reshelving some of the prehistoric pottery that was unlabeled. That was kind of mystery pottery. And I walked by one, this pot that I only had seen a picture of from when it was on display in the 1930s. And it was like, that's the pot. That's it. And I like went and grabbed the photo and held it up and was like, oh yeah, it's the crack. That's the right crack. And and like obviously the collections team was also delighted because, you know, they have all this stuff that they're trying to kind of work out what it is. And so they're like, oh, this is great. Now we know what this is, you know. Oh, um, so it really felt like a vindication that it didn't get blown up during the war. And, yeah. and so I, sort of from that, I started um, as I kind of finished you know, after I finished my PhD, I started working on a number of sort of Bronze Age um, sort of archival collections, like lost, <laughs> a lot of lost data sets, which arguably also my PhD was about too, because my PhD was a lot of really obscure sites that were, I had to go and track down and lots of obscure random publications, as you could imagine. And in Sicily, yeah. a lot of publications are like a couple given by the author, you know, sort of self-published. Um, so yeah. um, it's much easier now because because so much more stuff's online. But, um, uh, and I ended up working on a project called Micropass, which was a, a sort of experimental um, digital archeology span project um, funded by the AHRC. And it was experimental because we were using crowdsourcing to try to see if we could um, have that as part of the process of, of sort of managing records. And um, what we were trying to manage is there was this massive, um, card index of Bronze Age um, sort of tools and implements that went back to the early 20th century. And so it's essentially a precursor to the portable antiquity scheme and sort of the treasure scheme. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an amazing resource, but it was just this massive card catalog, literally a physical database of, of these objects, you know, in a, in a, 
you know, in a filing cabinet, again, in another storage facility, also something that Christopher Hawke stole for about 20 years and, and reordered mm. in a very strange way. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm all, I seem to always be in the, go the ghost of Christopher Hawke. But anyways, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so it was a real challenge because there's 30, about 30,000 of these cards to see if we could get them transcribed. And we thought, OK, it's going to take years. Um, but we did it we thought it would take about um you know 20 not 20 years but maybe 10 years and we did oh. it in about three three years transcribed everything wow oh, three, wow. Three okay. years. That's yeah dedication i tell you what i mean so this is the had... kind of this is the kind of work behind the scenes you know that the romantic idea of being an archaeologist <laughs> that nobody ever tells you about is probably yes. what i couldn't be i don't know about not, i won't speak for you Ruth, but but uh, no you know, i'm with you you know when you, when you stuff, hear that somebody hat, has I been going through <laughs> yeah, cataloging 150,000 flakes of flint and that kind of thing oh, you know, no it's, no life's it's too short endless. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, with this with this project, we use crowdsourcing, so we we wow. were lucky enough to have members of the public help us yeah. out, which was amazing. And we had such dedicated, literally such dedicated volunteers, and it was a real. I mean, you know, because I because I'm a dork and I really like these sort of things. Um, you know, actually, it was it was they're really stunning. The cards a lot a lot of them are hand drawn. They had a team of people who you know this is going back to sort of the nineteen early nineteen hundreds you know so they had a team people go out and collect this data a lot of the data would have been lost because a lot of it were things that at the time farmers were just plowing up or people were finding yeah. just as they do now but now you know we have these recording schemes in place so it's it's a real snapshot of the archaeological record you know up into until sort of the 70s 80s when we when we had more systematic mm -hmm. kind of recording starting to happen um so it's a complementary record and it's and it's really amazing and and they're so beautiful some of the cards like they had you know little maps like literally sometimes with x marks the spots on them so quite kind yeah. of romantic romantic things in their own right um but you know i think through a lot of these projects i've worked on and I, i'm gonna stop rattling on because i could go on forever but um <laughs> i got to sort of I got we got to kind of experiment with different ways of approaching prehistory and approaching research and kind of also presenting prehistory in, in kind of interesting and mm. in different ways. And that that kind of fed into obviously a lot of what we ended up developing um, for the World of Stonehenge exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was quite a few other projects I also kind of worked on that built up towards that, like a, yeah. we did a, a trail yeah. in the gallery around grave goods and so yeah. I, I think that that would be my my main takeaway is actually sometimes you kind of have to just try things out and see what works. And I'm sure you guys have found that through your, your own work, you know, see, yeah, see if totally. people respond sometimes to what you're just doing. Gotta, just got to give it a go and see what happens. I, but listen, I tell you what, uh, thank leaping... you so much for, for sharing all that, you know, because it just gives an indication of the... Uh, how what gets out to the public sits on the tip very tip of a uh, of an iceberg yeah, it's, a, it's just and, a tiny uh, percentage and, 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 and there in, the therein scenes, lies yeah. our job doesn't it really of trying to get as much of it out there as possible but so yeah. fast forward jennifer then just uh, in a nutshell because we need to crack on but fast forward so your move to english heritage now tell folks um what your job entails really what are you doing now particularly with you know what we were talking about the other day about Grimes Graves and Thornborough as well. Yeah, no, so um, I mean, for me, extremely exciting move, um, though also quite daunting because um, I've taken on the role from Susan Graney, who yeah. was incredibly experienced and well versed in so much archaeology. So big, big, massive shoes to fill. Um, but um, it's been it's been a really great move, and I think actually for me, coming from working on the World of Stonehenge exhibition, so you know, I mean, one of the downsides to archaeology, obviously, is sometimes there's a lot of temporary contracts. So um, you know, yeah. my time at the yeah. British Museum sadly yeah. came to the end, but you know, also on a on a good on a good moment, you know, on on an achievement of something we've been working on for a long time. Um, so, and I have to say, just did... reiterate, sorry, but uh, the World of Stonehenge exhibition was uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, you know, and a triumph, just have it to, was. Uh, uh, yeah. Say oh, that, you know, you. because uh, I've, I've become more and more conscious, you know, the amount of work 
uh, that uh, you and Neil and Duncan uh, did behind the scenes and, and the culmination of that uh, work was uh, so, so worth it and I think so appreciated by the general public and I think you achieved your aims with it you know and that is intriguing <laughs> the public about the stuff that's there beside Stonehenge in the you know through in the Neolithic uh, you know in northwest uh, northwest Europe I think it was a fascinating <laughs> eye-opener for everyone that um, that went and visited. Sorry, I had to say that. Just for, you know, so just folk well, know. Thank you. Just uh, so you know, folks. Um, <laughs> that's that's very kind of you. And I mean, it was definitely a, a labor of love. And and I mean, there was a massive team of people involved in the whole thing who also really, you know, put their heart and soul in it. And beyond Neil Duncan and I, um, and and also. I, we were so lucky to just be able to get the collections to have on display. And, and we worked with lucky, so many regional lucky, partners. I think, again, <laughs> and that is a question of hard work and determination. Well, yes, but I think also because of the limitations of COVID. I mean, one of, the, one of my yeah. favorite elements of the exhibition, personally, from a working experience, is because, you know, usually as a curator, going out and visiting all the museums and kind of choosing things you know which we we were able to do some of that but obviously because of covid we couldn't do everything and so i think mm -hmm. it made the exhibition a lot more collaborative especially with like regional museums in the uk because we really had to rely on other people's kind of expertise and and let them guide us which was great because they all have such amazing things to to show and to tell and and when we were installing the exhibition it really felt like a, a reunion when all these mm. people came in for the first oh, time <laughs> from all yeah, these yeah. museums and and actually really helped us with the displays too because they you know help d direct us or guide us with the best way to show off their objects and so yeah. you know i think that was it, it wasn't just the outputs of, of the british museum it was the output of like literally hundreds of archaeologists and, and their yeah. their you know years of work and and labor as well yeah. Ho hopefully you know hopefully we represented yeah. them well so no i, um, I couldn't but... let it go i couldn't couldn't sort of gloss <laughs> that over but sorry let's return oh, to thank you. english heritage english heritage uh, um uh, a lot a large part of our audience um most likely over the other side of the atlantic um aren't aware of mm -hmm. what english heritage is and and what it does so have you got a a sort of uh, have you got a an elevator <laughs> pitch for <laughs> english heritage yeah no so english heritage is one of the biggest organizations um heritage organizations in the uk um and we manage a huge array of of archaeological and historic mm -hmm. sites so um there is sort of it, it's a little bit complicated but um there is a sort of an official listing status that goes through through the government and through another agency called Historic England. Historically, English Heritage and Historic England were the same agencies, as we know, have now kind of um, split into to two different agencies that are still connected. Um, so this is a way of protecting the heritage of, of England. And, you know, there's hundreds, hundreds of these sites. And English Heritage really enables people to go and visit the sites. And what's amazing about it, I think, is actually the amount of sites that not only we have, you know, we have the really famous ones like Dover Castle and Stonehenge, you know, the really big ones, you know, that are, you know, ticketed sites, but there's, there's way more that are just free and everywhere. And the amount of places I'm now gone, because now, you know, I'm always looking that I've just visited and been in a random town to visit or something. And there's an, there's an English heritage site there that's usually free with signage. Um, so yeah. it, we, you know, it gives access to a massive amount of, um, of heritage and, and preserves that heritage and presents it to the public. So it's, yeah. it's digestible and accept, accessible. Um, yeah. So, and I, I work as part of, there's a team essentially of specialists that they call kind of property historians, essentially historians of these ancient places. Um, and I'm the prehistory specialist on that team. Uh, but I think what you said about the world of Stonehenge, it, it kind of it, it feeds in the same thing to me, which yeah, is yeah. I want really people to have a sense of awe and wonder about these places because I do. And I think they're so yeah. wonderful and often mysterious and, you know, often strange. And so it, for me now to be able to work with some of the sites and go out into the landscape and look at the ways we can research and present these places is, is an incredible opportunity. Mm. 
Yeah. No. Well said. Well said. Uh, you're you're in good company. I mean, the, you know, the, the, I think probably the vast majority of our uh, of our uh, viewers uh, are entirely uh, agree with that. That it's just that complete passion of uh, all these enigmatic places that are still there to be seen if you just know where to look. Yeah. And and as you say, it is wonderful to go to. Uh, you know, particularly with English heritage, you know that almost anywhere you go in Britain, there is uh, there is an English heritage site not far away. Even if it's just tucked away in the landscape, you know, a random henge there that you can go and uh, mm. uh, visit. As you say, signposted. You know that it's wonderful work that you do at English Heritage. Um, Before we move on where to we be? D- discussing <laughs> current archaeology and. Uh, and all the rest of it, and uh, the the news. Uh, just what's on your desk at the moment? What uh, where's your what's your giving attracting your focus at the moment in uh, at English Heritage? Yeah, so there's some extraordinary projects that we have just taken on, and um, so one one big project this last year, and and um, hopefully we'll have a big relaunch next year, which hopefully you, you two will be able to come. Too, um, uh, Ooh, is at a site. You, yes. Um, <laughs> is at a site called Grimes Graves, which is in Norfolk, so in East Anglia, um, eastern part of the country, and it's a really, it's a pretty extraordinary site because it's a, it's a Neolithic, late Neolithic flint mine, so it, it goes back over four thousand years, um, and it's an extraordinary network of, of mines that some of which go down over twelve meters in depth. <laughs> and, and there's over 400 mine shafts. So as you can imagine, Incredible. even though archaeologists have been working there for, gosh, about 150 years, um, there's still a lot to discover on yeah. site. Um, and um, we actually give access to a few of those mine shafts. So we're doing a project there to make things more accessible and more understandable, but also a lot more digital um resources and explorations that will be available to people if they can't make it to site or if they can't kind of climb down a big ladder <laughs> onto, yeah, onto this yeah. uh into the mine itself but you know i think one of the extraordinary things about grimes graves is it it's it's w- one of the few places and and you know the context of grimes graves is that they're they're f- mining flint this really beautiful deep dark flint in in the steps of as i said 12 meters um at the same time as there's building a lot of this, the ma- massive monuments that um, that are part of my remit as well, places like Avebury and Stonehenge. Um, so it's it's kind of in that same period, and and there's a question there: Why is there such a monumental mine? You know, is it because because they need the resources for building um, the materials, you know, for building these monuments, or is it kind of there's some almost you know ritual or performative display going on about Mm. the fact that they can access this kind of hard to get material um it's probably some kind of mixture of both because the thing that's really fascinating is down in the mine we find little um elements of ritual as well and and it probably was a site that had an industry you know in a practical sense in a modern sense you know material getting materials people need but also had maybe a, a ritual or religious element as well um, and we mm-hmm. find some really fascinating stuff. But I think the coolest thing is if you go down there, if you climb down there, you're in this space that was constructed by someone, you know, 4,500 years ago, and you're standing in the same space yeah. in a corridor, and you off and there's there's still their tools are still down there. So you, you see wow. an antler pick that they used to mine with, and you're like, yeah. that was left by yeah. a miner 4,500 years ago. It's yeah. just yeah. it's just yeah. a bit bonkers. It's like going in it back in time quite literally. So yeah. I, it, it's another world, and it's all full of chalk. So you come out looking like a ghost as well. So you literally <laughs> travel back in time and come back as the ghost of the past. So yeah. it's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing place. Um, and we're reopening. We'll be hopefully finishing our works um, in the next year and reopening um, next summer. So um, I will let you all know, obviously. And and the other yeah. really exciting site that I. I almost can't comprehend because it's so exciting. <laughs> is um, is Thornborough Henges, which has really been like another labor of love to get this under the management of English Heritage. It goes yeah. back to over twenty years that there was really a local community group that saved the henges because they were there's um, 
gravel extraction all around yeah. the site yeah. and they they almost gravel extracted up to the, the i mean the hedges themselves were protected the land around it wasn't so they were they wanted to yeah. extract up to literally the end and um edge of the hinges so it was real labor of love and when they went and did excavations and um and survey and other archaeological work there and this again this is going back 20 years they realized that it's a whole monumental landscape it is yeah. You know, I mean, it sounds cheesy to say Stonehenge of the North, but it's on that level for the amount of you got to say it though. <laughs> monuments. Yeah, it's 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 a monumental landscape of importance and on the level of some place like Stonehenge. And yeah. I, and sorry, I didn't even explain exactly what it looks like. I'm sure you've spoken about it before, but these three massive henge um, henges, meaning earthworks, so big banks and ditches that kind of are in a line um, over mm. the course of about, um, I think it's about two kilometers. And there's three of them in a row. And so they're so big, you, you can't almost get a sense of it when you're on the ground. Um, the best is the aerial photos. And and they have yeah. a kind of slightly a little crook in the way they're aligned. And, and um, there's some questions about that they might have alignments with Orion's Bell, because they kind of look like Orion's Bell, but they also have solstice connections with the way the sun rises. and and they're very processual, if you processual in the sense of going, you know, in a procession. Um, if you go and visit the site, you feel like you do just want to walk through them, and it's, it's a very kind of controlled experience. And we think they were built at the same time because they're very, exa yeah. basically yeah. exactly the same dimensions. It's, it's a bit so, long. I, I won't run it now, but I've actually got a movie. Like I could could run a movie. I, I did a visit <laughs> to the north. Uh, well, particularly to the to the north mm -hmm. uh, Henge, uh, and, and uh, you, you may have. Yeah, it, but I won't run it now. But I was just thinking because yeah. you know, I've got some aerial shots. But yeah, um, yeah. no, the it's a great time. Yeah, I would the northern hope that henge. Do more on it. Yeah, the northern henge has the best preserved banks and ditches yeah. um, outside of Avery, and they're awesome. I mean, they are which awesome. Is amazing. They, they yeah. knock your socks <laughs> off, and it's all hidden away in the woods there. Anyway, um, I think yeah. we should. <clears throat> Uh, sort of move our attention along to uh, uh, the um, <laughs> the news items that we've lined up for for tonight. Uh, thank you so so much, uh, you know, for talking about that and elucidating um, that um, and your role at uh, English Heritage, uh, Jennifer. Um, so I hope you, um, yeah, enjoy the. Hope we all enjoy the rest of the show. Um, anything else, Ruth, that you want to say before I bring up our first item from um, the, the uh, rest? Do you know, uh, no, let's crack on, because uh, otherwise I'll just start asking Jennifer all sorts of things and we could talk for <laughs> way too long about yeah, stuff yes. like, well, Thornborough Henges in particular, we, we must have yeah. a conversation another time and then tell yeah. folks about it after the event because, uh, yeah. yeah, we can I mean, be here For, all for night. example, and tomorrow. Abby... Abby Sue's got, uh, you know, straight in there with the pertinent question. Any thoughts on future access to Northern Hen the Northern Henge? But we won't go there right now. <laughs> <'cause it's> no. <laughs> oh, we, we have yeah. we have thoughts. We have thoughts. But um, yes, yeah. we won't go there now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll yeah. we, we will special. report, folks. We will report. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what's first up tonight? Um, uh, Ta -da, an, yes. An article in fizz.org. Um, uh, Iraq's uh, ancient treasures sandblasted by climate change. This article actually um, is more uh, about climate change than anything archaeological, as far as I can uh, make out. Well, so it's archaeology uh, in reverse, isn't it? it it's uh, yeah. and I have I have to say up, up front, <coughs> folks, that there's a there's a number of things uh, this evening that. Uh, it's not that they warrant us talking about for huge lengths of time. It's just we thought that they were things that uh, are in the archaeology news that you might not get to see, and it's just good to know about these things. Um, yeah. And what's happening in Iraq, because Iraq, for for, for various uh, climate reasons, uh, Iraq experiences more climate-related problems than almost anywhere else on the planet. And... Yeah. There are so many sites out there in the desert that archaeologists have been working for decades, excavating them from uh, from the desert. Uh, but the, over the last years, the uh, the winds have been so severe 
that all their hard work is just disappearing because sandstorms every year, multiple sandstorms, are just covering everything up again. And mm. an awful lot of their work is just shoveling the sand out again. That they, you know, they had cleared years before, and now they're mm. just having to clear it away and clear it away. Um, it's uh, it's shocking actually how much is is. It's not that it's being lost. It's just. Um, we risk it being lost. Really. It's not lost, but it, to uncover it again <clears throat> is a heck of a lot of work that wouldn't normally have to be uh, undertaken. I think your your what you just said, Rupert, pretty much covers you know the text of the um, the, the the article. Uh, yeah, itself. essentially. Yeah. And, Do you have a take uh, it, on that, uh, Jennifer? As uh, as a as a more kind of a hands on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's it's un, you know unfortunately climate change is impacting all of archaeology and heritage and you know obviously places like Iraq are are, are possibly getting hit worst first but it, it's a reality that we're all now having to deal with and I know for example historic England have a whole section that just deals with with planning for climate change essentially um mm. but you know in britain it's a slightly different issue um we have m things like masses of coastal erosion and in east east anglia for example you know we're losing actual heritage sites at a, at a pretty high rate i mean we're also it allows us to discover those sites like haysborough is, is a good example of that you know those oldest human footprints outside of outside of Africa, which is, you know, modern human footprints, yeah. ancient, ancient mm -hmm. modern. <laughs> um, and that was only discovered because the cliff collapsed because of um, erosion. But then they yeah. had to record it so quickly and it was washed away really quickly. And luckily they got to do things like 3D modeling and stuff. So they had enough time to kind of properly record it. But mm. um, so I, I, I think it, it's, it's something that is going to become more and more, you know, an issue everywhere in the world. And it's a real shame that you know a place that's already obviously had a lot of issues with, with war and other drought and things like that it's just yeah, a massive yeah. problem yeah. well it's funny great graham uh, said surely that's how they got covered over originally well yeah absolutely but <laughs> but the whole point here is that that if uh, you know the, the whole purpose of archaeology is that we can learn about our past human past and uh, and when archaeologists have gone to the trouble of excavating over years and years and years and we're still learning about the sites that for them to be covered over by sandstorms before we have extracted all the information that people have been working so hard to find uh, that's uh, that's what makes it a, a bitter pill I think. but um mm -hmm. but hey you know everybody is on the ground doing what they can as they can and you can't <clears throat> you can't do any more it's just uh, the fragility of the planet isn't it yeah I think mean, one of the archaeologists said, uh, yes, it, there it is, in the next 10 years, it's estimated that sand could have covered 80 to 90% of the archaeological sites. And that's a, that's a vast yeah. acceleration um, yeah. you know, in the rate of coverage. I think uh, that's the point to, to take home. Yes, naturally, they mm. would be blown over over time, but this is unprecedented, the rate that it's being... Uh, mm. Recovered and uh, you know, just making yeah, um, so yeah, work, yeah. I mean, Gra like Graham's art. just said as well. He said then build a roof over them, and, and therein lies the problem, Graham. The, the the thing is that that kind of project, so the sort of That's... thing that you see at Gebekli Tepe, for example, it costs so much so money, much. and yeah. uh, and you're not talking about the sorts of sites that uh, that would generate. Uh, uh, you Income. know, visitors coming to pay to actually make that expense worth spending. It's yeah. you know because people, generally speaking, they're not going to come and look at uh, you know, say a a a, a five thousand year old brick wall that we can learn stuff from, mm -hmm. but it's nothing fundamentally exciting to go and look at. Uh, so you know, mm. you just uh, it it's so difficult to fund. You know how you prioritize the funding of archaeology is one of the hardest things of all and you can't gratuitously say well you're all right we'll go and spend half a million pounds on this when you're not going to recoup that money um, in any yeah. way i know? mean that's, so that's it, a benefit very difficult. That the benefit that they have in uh, in turkey with sites like uh, gebekli tepe 
and probably they'll do more with uh, Kara and Tepe as, as time goes along and some of the other sites, is that uh, p politically, you know, um, they are well aware of the benefit to the economy from the tourism that having such sites um, uh, attracts. Um, in Iran and Iraq, that's not quite so much the case. Uh, I don't think the government is uh, uh, geared to uh, helping tourism in any way by uh, making these sites more accessible. And they're not that accessible in the first place, you know, like uh, it's <laughs> not, not that easy <laughs> to, uh, uh, to get to necessarily. Well, do you know what? It's quite <laughs> funny, really. I, it's not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we go into this uh, digression right now, but when Mike and I were looking at where we wanted to film for Gobekli Tepe's <laughs> Stonehenge, and yeah. we're looking at all these sites that we've dreamed of going to for different oh, reasons, geez. And, and just looking at where they are, I'm thinking, no, better not. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah, we could just spend so much money traveling ridiculous distances for, um, yeah, yeah, not yeah. a huge amount of return. <laughs> Should we, we move on to the, uh, the yeah, next item? Okay. Um, where are we? Here we go. Uh, yeah, archaeologists. Oh, it would help if it moved along. There we are. Archaeologists dug for evidence of the Rosetta Stone's ancient Egyptian rebellion, and here's what they found. We're in danger here, folks. We're yeah. in danger of spending the rest of the program uh, uh, on this one because it's glorious. Well, shall I so say many... very briefly? I'll yeah. say very briefly because this is the one that for for, the, for those of you that were watching last month, oh, and yeah. uh, and I said that there was one we'd missed out, and I promised that we'd do it this month. Uh, this is it. And the reason that this one flagged up for me, hand in the air, ignorance, all right, that uh, the fact that everybody knows that the Rosetta Stone is what enabled us, us to translate uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, that prior to that, it was all a big mystery. Nobody knew what they meant. But here was a stone where uh, where the same thing was written in Greek and Coptic. I think was it Coptic as well, and uh, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, and uh, and that's all I knew that the Rosetta Stone was this thing that had enabled us to uh, to translate hieroglyphics. And suddenly, here's this thing where a team of archaeologists. Are actually looking at they're excavating to try to find evidence for what it says on the on the Rosetta Stone. I thought oh, I never knew what it said on the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> I had no idea. It was just yeah. the fact that it was kind of a translator stone. Um, magic magic so, stone. <laughs> yes, exactly that magic stone. So to find out that this is a a decree that yeah. uh, uh, that is about uh, this massive rebellion. And uh, and it, it it spanned the reigns of uh, Ptolemy's four, five, and six, I believe, and it's the fact that they I were think it's five. It constantly it's, find... it's narrowed down to the, the um, Ptolemy um, principally five, five but they, it's yeah. uh, it, it's kind of it, it grazes. Yeah. Um, now, what are the dates? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Academic. Shall, shall I the just, point uh, is... I'll just read uh, a, little, a little bit. The, the Rosetta Stone is not known for its content, but as a lexicon of Egyptian hieroglyphics. The decree inscribed in the stone, however, discusses a violent revolt, largely lost to history, that shaped the trajectory of Western civilization. <laughs> Had the young <laughs> pharaoh, Ptolemy V, been overthrown, events like the Hasmonean Revolt, which established a Jewish kingdom, the affairs of Cleopatra with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, and even the rise of Christianity may have yeah. looked very, very different indeed. So my takeaway uh, largely from this, uh, the, the three elements, and the huge one here, is, as it's just mentioned, is the contingency of things, how relatively small events can have massive, uh, long-reaching effects. Ch should we say a few words, though, about how they managed to narrow um, this yeah, event uh, down um, and uh, correlate it with the uh, with, with the Rosetta <laughs> Stone itself, Rupert. Yeah, go on. Oh me. Yeah, go on. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell Tim I uh, ruins of the ancient city of uh, Tumus in uh, I think it's no Thmus in Egypt's Nile Delta. Um, I'm just. 
get yourself up to concentrate on the thing. The problem with it is, of course, ma matching the date. And here in these ruins, um, th they had the good fortune. And, and with the ruins are full of signs of conflict, you know, of uh, battle, of... Uh, uh, a revolt and you know, all the rest of it. So those signs, you know, plenty of bones and skeletons with injuries showing uh, people knocking seven bells out of each other. That's uh, the question. That's the um, uh, not a question. What is a question is is dating it so it falls into the right thing and correlates with the with the Rosetta Stone, and they're able to date it because the lower layers layers be below where this activity was going on was coinage dated <laughs> dating to Ptolemy the fourth and above it all was uh, coinage dating to Ptolemy the uh, Ptolemy the sixth bingo and also um, a four place dinner serve setting for uh, in the style of you know things from the right period uh, right in there so they've nailed the date nothing sophisticated there I mean just goes to show how great it is if you've got coinage. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to love the dinner service, though, for crying out loud. Yeah. And, and written records. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's kind of one of the important points, isn't it? That we're grazing this line between prehistory mm. and history. And that's such an exciting aspect of the work that any of us do in this field, is when you, when you, you find any kind of written evidence for something that you would otherwise never have heard about because it's on that mm. Uh, mm. The sort mm. of twilight zone. Yeah. Well, the background... But I, to, to, sorry, uh, sorry, Jennifer. No, no, it's okay. I, please continue. <laughs> but, I was the, just going to say, what, basically what Rupert said, that is I looked at, I've looked at the Rosetta Stone so many times and never once actually realised mm. what it was talking about, which is just <laughs> terrible, that, right? That, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, but, and it never occurred to me that I was missing anything. It, it, you no, know, that's the shocking no. thing about it. Mm, and it's terrible. fascinating that they were once this whole rebellion happened, they put these notifications all around the country, like, "Oh, look, now we've squashed this," just to let you all know. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's, that's right. Yeah, really, how many copies yeah. of it were there? I mean, there was something like about eleven copies or so. of it, weren't there? But forty, um, I seem to remember forty. Was it forty? So? Okay, uh, it was multiple, like I, you know, identical things. And the reason that the Rosetta Stone is so famous is because it's the one that was found by the French soldier and uh, you know was used to translate. 19, but 14, um, yeah, yeah, amazing that there were so but, many. But the fascinating thing is that the background to the the story is the. Um, uh, it's in the news a bit at the moment because focus is on you know um, the uh, dynasty that was in existence in Egypt at that time, and it was Greek. Greek Empire mm. was in control of uh, yeah. Egypt, you know, mm. together with an arrangement that with the the Nubians at the time, and the Egyptians themselves were under the thumb. So this revolt that was happening in the uh, in the Nile Delta, and particularly at uh, Tel Timai or uh, Thmuis, um, the, uh, the ancient city of, of, of Thmuis, was uh, it's uh, really a case of uh, the rebellion uh, happening and uh, the empire striking back, it seems, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then telling everybody, well, you know, don't try it again, folks. Here's what happened, and this mm. is, and we're in charge. Uh, but going on to the contingency aspect uh, of it um where can i get to uh the, the the results of that um have you got those in your head rupert um the the possibilities uh, and the change uh, the and the consequences of that uh, of that revolt and the uh, suppression of that revolt the consequences, mm. uh, no. Yeah. Do you, I, I, oh, God, you, oh, I'm trying to question your screen again. Let me, let me just read from it. Evidence from other sites and details suggested that there were economic and political consequences for those cities that joined the rebellion, such as closing harbours. Um, another stone decree gives an account of the Greek general uh, Aristarchus, who left some, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, the 
The outcome of the Egyptian revolt against Hellenistic imperialism had far-reaching consequences. The Egyptians had appointed their own pharaohs and, with the help of the Nubians, took control of much of Egypt. Uh, after 20 years of conflict, the Hellenistic military machine subdued the rebellion. The last rebel leaders were murdered when they, ca I can't help thinking of Star Wars, when they came to negotiate <laughs> peace at the Nile Delta city of Sais. Had the Egyptians prevailed, e Egypt might have taken a very different turn. Their traditional gods of Isis and her son Horus, for example, might not so easily surrendered their identities to Mary and Jesus with the coming of Christianity. Mm. Uh, after securing control of Egypt, the Ptolemaic dynasty played a key role in the geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean. It supported the Jewish revolt against the Seleuc uh, Seleucid dynasty of Syria, establishing a Jewish kingdom. So what if that had never happened? Mm. Uh, you. Um, and of course, um, Queen Cleopatra was a vital character in the story of how the Roman Republic became an empire. What if that? Mm. It's it sounds like it's almost like one of those alternative history films, you know, yeah. where where yeah. they they do yeah. explore yeah. like oh the rebellion worked and then all the knock on effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it's it's quite a good uh, set of mind games to play, isn't it? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. of what what if, what, what, what if? if, and also yeah. of course. Um, we didn't put a time scale on this. I don't think any of us mentioned a date, and we're talking around about 200 BC. <laughs> so relatively uh, recent and yeah, impactful on recent uh, history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think something said, I always uh, I always want to uh, say when uh, uh, when we're talking about this period in particularly Egyptian history uh, is just um, uh, it always surprises me that we we talk about Cleopatra as if uh, as if it's just a given, the fact that we're always talking about a Cleopatra. But I do think it's important to mention that this one was Cleopatra the Seventh. Uh, there were seven of them, because um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, I don't know what the other girls off. did, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be showing off if I could tell you all their dates. I certainly can't do that. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, go I, on then. I, moving on. I, I sometimes wish that we talked less about Cleopatra and more about like Hatshepsut. I think that's how you say her name. Yeah. You know, yep, the, yep. the female pharaoh who, you know, basically took power and controlled things for a long time. You know, and built amazing yes. monuments. You know, so well, I think you know there is, is obviously. One that I have wanted to visit forever, and uh, me too. And I, I, I kind of, I quietly hope that Mike and I one day find the excuse to do a whole Egyptian thing because it's um, oh yeah, it, it's something that we've avoided for so long. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, who we'll do Gebekli Tepe to the pyramids? That would that would be a shorter trip, <laughs> no less intense. <laughs> East, e yeah, you would have to do all of the Eastern Mediterranean. That would be a lot That's of archaeology. Right. Exactly, we would, we would. Yeah. We'd have to drag you along with us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh my god! Yes, I'm signed up. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, coming well away uh, from. Uh, yeah, from Egypt. Uh, let's go to Siberia, is it, Rupert? Do you know what? I haven't even got my uh, uh, my notes in front of me. I do apologise. Uh, bear, bear with me, Carlos. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. It's the Denisovan <laughs> Cave. Uh, mm -hmm. we, um... Who owned this Stone Age jewellery? New forensic <sighs> tools offer an unprecedented answer. Mm. Um. Uh, interesting article because at first glance, when I glanced at it, I thought that this was a um, new DNA, DNA techniques had been used to identify a Denisovan owner of this pendant, but it mm. is uh, not so. Just because it was mm. found in the uh, uh, Denisova cave in Siberia mm. uh, does not mm. mean that this pendant belonged to a Denisovan. But in itself, that's one of the exciting things about the Denisovan caves, yeah. that it, it was a, 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 a melting pot, if you like, for we know that uh, that Denisovans, uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals were all living there at uh, different times, crossing over to some extent. 
Yeah. Um, I'll read. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, and because the, the importance of this article is not actually necessarily who was wearing the pendant, though we'll, that's a very interesting question. An international team of researchers has recovered DNA from the owner of a deer tooth pendant that was buried inside a remote Siberian cave for tens of thousands of years. Uh, in research published in Nature, Eleanor Essel of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany and colleagues detail how they developed a new technique to extract DNA left behind on an artifact. It's, this, this article is, a, is about all hail to scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, in much the same way police solve crimes using touch DNA, DNA recovered from skin cells or trace bodily fluids left behind when somebody uh, touches an object, archaeologists will now be able to recover genetic traces of ancient humans from the artifacts the, they left behind. These traces will reveal the biological sex and genetic ancestry of the individual who once held or wore a particular artifact, allowing archaeologists to link genetic and cultural evidence as they attempt to unravel uh, the deep past. Um, now, um, my understanding is that uh, this only applies if the pendant or whatever it is that has been touched is made of of bone. And I didn't mm. quite realize this distinction, but the particular thing about uh, uh, bone and tooth is that it is porous in a mm. way that so many other materials are not. So it is able to absorb those bodily fluids and preserve them beneath the surface. That's the particular thing. And this technique um, breakthrough technique is about being able to extract the uh, DNA, the remains of the bodily fluids from um, within uh, that, that have been in, uh, absorbed into the bone uh, itself. Um, so, I mean, I could show you. <laughs> I mean, just to we've got to, we've got to do we've got to at least look at a bit of science, you know, even. Uh, if we don't understand it, you know, as if you needed any. Well, you're going to show, show a bell curve. I, I, I think it's it's worse than a bell curve. I mean, you know, oh. I, you know, I'm just trying to underline the work that gets done. That's all. Yeah. You know, and look at the language, guys. Look at the language. Oh, <laughs> you got to know your yeah. stuff. Look yeah, that. that's the one. Look at that. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I'm gonna zip they said, to the what, what, what species uh, of deer was it? A wapiti deer? They've uh, uh, wapiti deer. Uh, yes, they were able to. Yeah. Oh, they, they can get that directly from the uh, the tooth or the uh, mm. itself. Um, so I'll just nip through the summary, the conclusions. Uh, our work highlights that artifacts made from bones or teeth are uh, our previously untapped source of ancient human DNA that can provide insights about the ancestry and biological sex of the individuals who handled, carried, or wore these objects in the deep past. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything there that we haven't already said, except that, uh, Rupert, I mean, uh, if you, what about the results? They've matched the DNA from this individual from what, 25,000 years ago? Yeah. And the DNA matches to well, it's well, it's Homo sapiens. It's not. It's not yeah. a Denisovan. Um, yeah, and uh, and and that in itself is just so exciting that, that you know it's a modern human from the Denisovan caves. Uh, and um, honestly, it's probably not appropriate now to go off on one, but uh, but we have talked about uh, Denisovan caves a number of times in the past. Uh, particularly with uh, one of the, um, the the sets of remains that they found, if you can call any of them sets of remains when they're so scant. Uh, but they did find uh, one that was uh, the daughter of, uh, and I believe it was a Denisovan mother and a Neanderthal father. I think it was mm -hmm. that way around. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it, it's the fact that our ancestors were mixing together you know, being together in this part of the world where the Denisovans were going from their 
mostly there to the east and the Neanderthals were more from there to the west and obviously uh, Homo sapiens at the time coming more to the west as well. Um, it's just, for me, I find it such an evocative thing that you can imagine these people coming together and obviously for them there was no question of them being different uh, subspecies of, of hominin. Uh, you know, they're just they're just people who maybe had slightly different features. Well, you know, a lot of us do today. They would have had no knowledge of their uh, inherent differences there. And I find mm -hmm. that, oh, God, if only we could be like that today, A, we, <laughs> we could remove so many problems from the world if nobody gave a damn. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I just, I love that about the Denisovan caves it's um mm. yeah but the particular matches they're able to extract from uh, th this particular tooth though showed affinity with um homo sapiens or descendants uh, over to the east more and native american dna that mm. was i thought the uh, sort of slightly jaw-dropping uh, takeaway from this apart from the development of the new technique mm. It, yeah. it opens up a possibility in the sort of personal biography of objects in, in a completely new way, which is really, really exciting. And I, you know, if I think about sort of more recent European prehistory context, if we think about stuff like amber, like I'm wearing amber today, amber is very porous. And we, we know that in sort of, early Bronze Age, a lot of the burials with amber are necklaces that are taken apart and putting put back together, you know, in different combinations. So this is the work of someone like Alison Sheridan. Um, and I just think like, wow, you know, we could actually potentially trace individual objects that have this kind of porous, yeah. you know, sort of like, like the bone or um, we could potentially trace how things, individual things moved in a completely new way. I mean, the only downside is obviously the excavation they use the technique is incredibly intense because it's they can't have any you know contamination so i think they were wearing hazmat suits when they were excavating that's that's the only downside but presumably mm -hmm, the, yeah. the technology will continue to develop and get even mm. more accessible yeah uh, Francis says the Max Planck uh, Institute in uh, Leipzig, headed by Professor Johannes Krauss, is absolutely astounding. A couple of his lectures in English are on YouTube and well worth a visit. Um, thanks for that, uh, Francis. And uh, 325 Stuart, is it, uh, uh, you said, are there any more recent uh, published ancient DNA studies for Denisovan DNA since uh, 2017. There, there, there are. I hate to bold <clears> that crudely, <throat> um, but I thought if anybody knew, um, um, it wasn't. There <laughs> are. I, I couldn't. T I couldn't begin to tell you off the top of my head, though. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly they have. You got to bear in mind. I saw there was another comment, and I didn't see who it was from, and it's f gone past my. Uh, window now, but <clears throat> somebody said somebody was saved by a Denisovan giant. We have not found enough Denisovan remains to ever make statements uh, like that. Uh, everything that we know about Denisovans is that they just look like us. Um, uh, yeah, uh, no, no big ones or anything unusual. Uh, it, you know, the, the the numbers of remains that have been found remains very small. Very small. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. I think I think we move on. Um, yeah, go on. Agreed. Okay. Uh, we are six thousand year old settlement found oh, in the yes. island of uh, of Corsica. So, not so much talk, many talking points around this. This is just a you know statement of um, uh, just news. Just, you need to know news, this. This is exciting. News. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing meaningful here, folks. <laughs> uh, but again, I, I fancy tickled here because I was recently on Sardinia and. Uh, uh, yeah. Corsica and Sardinia are adjacent. Uh, uh, Corsica is slightly smaller and north of Sardinia in the Mediterranean Sea, all just off the west, you know, not far off the west coast of uh, Italy. Um, so <laughs> huge goings on uh, in the Neolithic and the um, Chalcolithic and, and Bronze Age 
on both uh, Corsica and Sardinia, so much so that, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully we'll be able to do a special. I brought back some footage from uh, Sardinia, which will help along yeah. with that. However, this is um, uh, both Neolithic and uh, a late Neolithic uh, settlement. Archaeologists in a French municipality recently excavated the slopes of Punta Campania, uh, on the island of Corsica in preparation for construction project. Hello, hello. And found yeah. an expensive, expansive, expensive, expensive very good. <laughs> an expansive <laughs> Neolithic site. Um, <clears throat> site in Sota uh, contains two distinct settlements. Um, uh, uh, the first settlement is partially preserved, while the second is well preserved. So they've got the first settlement down to the early 4th millennium BC and it had a, in it a stone structure containing the remains of an obsidian napping workshop. Um, mm. So my ears pick up, prick up now when I hear uh, uh, obsidian mentioned in the Mediterranean because I think obsidian is one of the big glues that hold held the whole trading network of the Mediterranean through millennia um, yeah. although yeah. although it has to be said Sardinia itself and I think there are sources on Corsica itself for mm. obsidian um, um, but it, it's just underlying how I important think, yeah go on Jennifer I, I was just I was gonna say I think a lot of the Corsican um, a lot of the obsidian did actually come from Sardinia I think that was, and that was obviously okay. the, the reason why Sardinia, I think, got so sort of developed in prehistory. Yeah. Possibly. Because there, there was a paper I saw that uh, that was talking about three obsidian um, locations, outcrops uh, on Corsica. But as you say, it's, uh, it just shows how important it was as a product um, or as a material. Yeah product as a material <laughs> um a, a, something that i wanted to ask you because you might know uh from your work about mediter well if you don't know you don't know uh with, with <laughs> mediterranean related stuff was uh because they're very close together uh mm -hmm. so if you go back six thousand years uh could you have walked between the two were sea levels uh different enough back then that you could have walked from one island to the other because they're that close, and I did wonder. Yeah, I'm. I'm not completely sure, um, but I would imagine. I mean, you. I would have to look at one of those maps um, mm -hmm. to see if if they did kind of connect up. But certainly, I know just because I obviously I, just because I've worked more in Sicily. Um, I know a lot of the the islands around Sicily were connected up. Um, so mm. if that would probably indicate that they potentially were you know, mm. they were connected up. And, you know, what also mm. I think is really interesting is how they have that in the Mediterranean, they have those crazy megafauna yeah. from, from yeah. similar eras. And because of that kind of ice, the, the shifting sea levels and the ice ages and then animals getting isolated, you know, yeah. on those places. Marco so. says no. Alexander Marco says, says no. no. Alexander says no. Uh, and, Mar okay. and Marco said 12,000... BC 12, is that 12,000 uh, BP? Yes. Uh, uh, Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Interesting. That would be that would be the last glacial yeah. period. So potentially, yeah. so going and back that's that the thing. Far, it that's... also maybe shifted. It would have not always been one or the other. I but I don't know off the top mm. of my head the exact. You know. No. Well, it's almost unimportant. It was just one of those idle thoughts I had and wondered if it would make any difference to what we were talking about. You know. Probably uh, does... not a lot. Um, but uh, uh, Sardinia is significant <laughs> in the Neolithic, uh, and uh, yeah. you know I mean, th this site um, is uh, in the south, right, right down in the south of Corsica. Up in the north yeah. of Sardinia uh, is an extraordinary site. Um, some people have described it as, as a pyramid. It's it's a raised stepped platform, uh, more yeah. likely, but it is dated to the Neolithic, and I think it's the I mean, uh, for for that time, uh, it's a, a astonishing um, piece of monumental uh, work, <laughs> a sort mm. of stepped pyramid -y mm. kind of raised platform uh, that's there on mm. Sardinia. It's not repeated anywhere else. It's uh, uh, mm. Europe's oldest 
pyramid they say i don't like using yes. the word pyramid because it's so misleading yeah yes <clears throat> it, it reminded me of that's the, the temple of perhaps uh, wandering, uh, wandering so, so, actually, so but, uh, that's what it's called monte da covey or no, yeah da covey thank you i'd uh, forgotten completely i was not able to get to it it was uh, sardinia is pretty big and it takes a long time to get from uh, yes. one end of it to, to the other it's big and mountainous that's what uh, <clears throat> yeah. makes it slow traveling yeah. wise. anyway uh, but that was it that was it it was just it. settlement yeah, yeah. found obsidian napping factory found uh, or napping <clears throat> workshop uh, we thought that was exciting yeah, uh, yeah. and I graham think... says there are many sites where obsidian can be found in the eastern mediterranean yes and the principal mm -hmm. site mm. that we refer to was you know in the uh, early uh, neolithic and expand when farmers were expanding out there uh, is the source on uh, milos and that's the um one of the cycladean islands uh, and yes. that seems to be a, a major magnet for people. Um, yes, which is uh, which is all the, all a part yeah. of uh, our Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge. Yeah. Series. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We don't want any plot it, spoilers here, do we, Rupert? It's it's <laughs> the one thing that the um, the obsidian. Oh, sorry. Have I frozen a bit? Um, no, no, you're fine. The um, obs the obsidian. It's like if you do field walking or field work in, in the Mediterranean, it's so extraordinary because it's so beautiful and glassy. And, it, you know, I mean, we talk about our flint, but it's whoa, it's like a whole nother level. <laughs> and and when I was in Sicily, you get so many different also colors of some of this material that it's just it's just like outstanding, you know, mm. and you could see even that photo, those little bladelets are so exquisite. They're really so yeah. fine. Mm. And they would be razor sharp. So I think there is something really kind of evocative about the the um, the obsidian, and and you know, obviously in the Mediterranean there are these different key sources, and and Sicily has different sources than Sardinia and Corsica, and it's a kind of you get a different then kind of sphere of influence around that, mm -hmm. um, which is quite interesting to kind of track. But yeah, and well, the I fact know... that people are going out to these islands that some of them are quite remote, yeah. really yeah. early I on. I know, said, said it before. But it's worth saying, uh, again, reiterating that obsidian still can't be beat for sharpness, despite mm. modern materials. Obsidian is the, the one thing that you can get down to one molecule of, uh, you know, thickness wow. on, of on edge the blade thickness. Edge. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible. Sharper <clears throat> than a scalpel. Amazing. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that won't be the last time we talk about obsidian, will it be, Rupert? <laughs> it will not. It will not. Talking of which, what? Oh, I just wondered if you wanted to plug oh, anything. That was a... well, actually, no. That's a that's a very very good point. You'll have to forgive us, uh, Jennifer, as we just do, do a little bit of a, a sideline, um, because uh, as you know, uh, Rupert and I uh, were together um, uh, down in France. I went down to <clears throat> France to. Uh, work on Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge uh, to really put the uh, put a rocket under the backside of it of the project and uh, <laughs> make sure it got kicks kick started. And we did some uh, great work of of planning our journey from Gebekli Tepe, Katlohoyuk, and to the east and to the western coast of uh, of Turkey to um, get us into the Adriatic and uh, up into mm -hmm. the Balkans and Greece and and so on and so forth. So, so that's great. That's kind of fixed in our heads. If you don't, I think, though, Rupert, if people don't mind, I'll run the uh, the promotional video uh, of it. Um, it bears it reiteration. We've actually, before I run this, I have to say, we have um, funded um, the first episode and any funds now coming through uh, are rolling over into the second episode, which will describe the journey um, up the Danube and uh, the uh, development of the mm. linear band ceramic cultures and the spread of the Neolithic over into mm -hmm. Central and Northern Europe. Um, that's before we get to the uh, megalith building. And uh, it's, mm -hmm. that in itself is quite a story. But for it's those... very exciting, and it's worth worth saying that uh, it, rather than making it sound as if it's two separate projects, you know, Mike's just said that oh. we've we've actually achieved the funding for episode one. Any funding that comes in now 
that uh, goes into episode two, we are actually intending to start the filming for episode two at the same time as we're finishing the filming for episode one. It will yeah. be in the same trip. We're just going to go from uh, one well, to the other. So, so, do, so do keep sending <clears throat> us your money because that will enable yeah. us to do <laughs> episode two sooner. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Uh, uh, filming first filming is slated for November this year, and uh, the second lot, including the beginnings, if not the completion of the second episode, in April May next year. So things are moving along. With that said, I will run the promotion. If you've seen it before, bear with us. But you know, yeah, go get a coffee. Or... We would like you to help us to take you on an extraordinary journey. We're asking you to help us answer the question of. Not only how did this amazing monument down here in the south of France come to be, this is the Domaine de Fade near Ciron, but what led to the construction of thousands and thousands of megalithic monuments throughout northwestern Europe and ultimately, at the end of the Neolithic period, Stonehenge, about a thousand miles that way on the Salisbury Plain. The answer isn't here nor on Salisbury Plain. And in order to even begin to tell the story of the Neolithic, we need to be somewhere else. And at another time, thousands of years even before this ancient monument was built. And for that, we need to head east. is in helping to tell the story of how, from the earliest farming in Mesopotamia in the Fertile Crescent, humans came to leave their mark on the world in the form of the great tombs, henges and megaliths that we wonder at today. We plan to make a series of films to illustrate that story, and we'd like your help. We need your support to raise the funds necessary to begin filming the series, starting right now with the first episode. Supporting this project is really easy. We have a Buy Me A Coffee webpage where you can make a contribution for as little as $5, or as much as you want. Each and every single dollar raised will go towards the travel and subsistence costs necessary for each stage of filming. You'll find loads more information about our plans and our funding goals on our Buy Me A Coffee website. For the moment, though, it seems that we've come as far as we can. In front of us is the Mediterranean Sea. That way, that way lies Italy, Sardinia, Greece, the Aegean, Turkey, Cyprus, northeast. What have we got northeast? We've got the Great Steppe, we've got the Balkans, up the Danube. Yeah. Ah, good grief. That way. What have we got that way? Uh, well, if we turn right, go that way, turn right, then we go along the bottom part of Spain, of Andalusia, and you know, up then up the Atlantic seaboard, up to Brittany, which leaves only one place left to go, really, isn't it? Going home for us. Yes. Yeah, the God. point is, we're going to have to visit all these places if we're going to stand a chance, any chance at all, of explaining the presence on Salisbury Plain of a set of sarsen stones we call Stonehenge. Yes, so please donate now and help us to start that journey. We thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I gather some people are experience buffering, experiencing some um, buffering on uh, YouTube um, before and during that. So, um, sorry. Oh, that. dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't know what we can do about that. The recording will be fine, but I um, don't know what the cause of the buffering is. Um, but there we are. <laughs> anyway, um, if you find yourself so moved by our little promo video, links in the description <laughs> below to our um, uh, Buy Me A Coffee uh, campaign <laughs> site where you can uh, donate as little as, uh, what is it, five, five quid a, for a coffee, isn't it? It's five, five quid a coffee. Yeah. <clears throat> We've had some very generous people, actually, haven't we? We uh, are very uh, grateful, yeah. indeed. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Sort of, 
really helped us getting to that first uh, milestone. Anyway, uh, mm. enough said about that, I think. Before that we, uh, we, that we looks on. incredibly am ambitious. And, you know, if you need uh, extra people to come along and help you with that. Absolutely. <laughs> Flipping loot lead, we do. Yes, you, you can come come to the Mediterranean with us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, uh, any the... any of it. it sounds it sounds yeah, great. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I, it made me think when you you were when you were saying about kind of your when you're sitting on top of the tomb in in France that um, you know, the, have you read the book Inside the Neolithic Mind? Yes, by. Uh, uh david lewis williams and david pierce it's it's just it's really interesting about how something changed in people's minds and their outlook in the world and and while you know obviously there's thousands of years between some of these sites you know that mm. some of those ideas kind of came through in these different ways it's really it's really fascinating it's really fascinating mm -hmm. yeah it's very profound and uh and it's, it's something i mean you know we try to get across uh how profound it is being at these sites uh you know mm. you were saying it earlier on when you were talking about grimes graves that when you're sharing the space it's like being in a time machine you know that you're you're in exactly the same space as somebody all those years ago um and you you can't help but be aware of the fact that you're actually filling a space where somebody once stood you know, like a ghost, really. That you're you're overlap, but but for the time, you're physically overlapping in that space, and I find that uh, I find it very moving, actually. Uh, particularly, you know, yeah. I mean, at Scarabray, um, you know, the, the experience at Scarabray. You know, quite you know overcome, that, he was quite overcome. I, I, I was, I was, I was really overcome. <laughs> you know, when you put your hand, you put your hand on the edge of a bed, and you know that yeah. someone's done that loads of times. Um, yeah, I do. I find it very moving. It's, it, it's very personal. And I mean, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and, and also if you, sometimes when you're, if you're working on an excavation, you have a similar sort of thing Ooh, that yeah. you're digging something up and you're like, wow, yeah. this, this has been here maybe, f you know, for thousands of years. And the last person who touched mm. it was thousands of years ago. And you know, it, I, there's this I, intimacy. I, I the find, time collapse. you know, that even, even in, it, it, not even archaeologically speaking, you know, have you ever driven down a road where they're, they've torn down a house because they're rebuilding something, whatever, so the house is not there, but you can see where the staircase went up and you can see where the tiles yeah. are on the floor, where the, where the front door was or where the kitchen was or what have you. And, you, you know, you just can't help but wonder on, you know, the lives of the people that were in that space and it's now it's just kind of been removed and it's, it's things like that things like that just trying to put your finger on people's lives in the past alison alder expects us to to do the more and wise thing at the end bring me sunshine yes <laughs> yeah it's always <laughs> a toss-up between time. that or peter cook and dudley moore it depends how yeah. rude we want to be and <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do at gobekli tepe maybe we can yes. fit that in somehow yeah <laughs> Uh, Actually, you I have think, no uh, idea uh, how many Rupert's times little I knee dance, little yeah. knee dance at the end, heavily influenced <laughs> by Eric. I have, I, has to be surely. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Aye, 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 aye. <laughs> uh, shall we move on? Because we uh, yes. the time is is moving on, and uh, uh, probably mm -hmm. if we can be mindful of being a, a little briefer, perhaps I think these articles are not quite yes. so the heavy talking points that we've uh, had so <clears> far. <throat> no. So where are we? We're going to Croatia. We, we are. Um, yeah. Seven thousand year old submerged road discovered under the Mediterranean mm. Sea. I think the more okay. What's the mm. distinction? Is it Adriatic or is it Mediterranean? Or is it the Adriatic part would, of the Mediterranean? Which way does that work? It would be officially, I would say, the Adriatic, but I it obviously so. connects connects yeah. to the Mediterranean. So yeah. Mm. Um, but anyway, I'll repeat mm. that: seven-year-old submerged road discovered under the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, yeah. Mm. What is it? What can it all mean? Um, 
<coughs> well, once again, it's kind of uh, excavations are ongoing, so there's not there's not much we can tell you uh, other than the fact that I just think it's exciting that it's been found. Well, um, exactly, a deliberately uh, to... made road. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. a, a curious item because not only the road, but you've got deliberately artificially made islands or mounds upon which the settlements are made. Sort of kind mm. of reminding me of the Cranach principle, but uh, uh, these yeah. are entire yeah, settlements, point, it actually. seems. Yeah. Um, mm. a, a, and uh, the, 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 offshore, um, um, the offshore islands uh, were discovered relatively accidentally offshore. Uh, and now they've discovered this road linking the mainland uh, of this uh, Croatian island called uh, Korčula. Um, um, they've now dis they've dis first discovered this one off the east of the island, uh, sort of southeast of the island. Now they've found another one off the northwest of the island with an almost uh, identical configuration. Um, mm. But there's there's pottery and artifacts uh, down there, and mm. uh, and now this uh, this road. Now I don't look. I don't know why I've got to scroll past all these uh, images here. Um, oh well, that's changed. Before I was you're not showing about... anything anyway. Oh no, I'm not. Am I? <laughs> there oh, we go. Oh. oh, that's that's handy. I don't know what that's apropos of, and a hole in the ground. Um, but we can actually <laughs> see um, a real person. underwater archaeologist um, actually working on this yeah. road. I mean, um, uh, I'd like to just toss in here um, yeah. that this is one of the reasons th that the question was raised in my head about sea levels around Sardinia and Corsica, because this is not a million miles away. And it's uh, five meters underwater. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, so, I uh, I mean, so yeah. I, I, I'm not so convinced on the certainty that uh, people have that uh, uh, that they might not have been joined. That's all I thought. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the landscape it's... is very rugged there. We're back to Sardinia. Yes. Corsica. Yes, so, it so is. So we're at the end of the pretty much at the end of the Alps there. So, so yes. the depths between them you know you probably get quite severe gaps between those uh, islands it's not uh, a lot, lot uh, but of but you know what you know what humans are like though if there's any rocks yeah. joining anything that they'll find them uh, yeah. it was it was no more than a question raised in my head yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Carrie Ann um, says are those wheel ruts and I have to say of course that I'm reminded of those uh, tracks that there are on Malta on Malta yeah yeah yeah, yeah. which we uh, yeah, yet to be solved that um so that's really we can't really say much more than that I mean it's uh, excellent watching uh, I think underwater archaeology <laughs> watch that forever Jen? it's it's just it's fascinating that you know because I, I got to go on a trip um pre-pandemic around the Adriatic to some, and I visited some of the Croatian islands and I unfortunately didn't get to this one, but I remember driving past kind of where it was. Um, and I think, you know, we, there's these historical empires that are sort of island based all around there. And obviously the Venetian empire is the most famous one and probably the longest living one. Um, so it's, it's kind of fascinating to think that almost this, this was, you know, happening maybe going back 7,000 years ago. That's kind of, insane oh, but yeah. it also goes back to that point um about you know these people who slowly moved across europe with these with this sort of neolithic ideas i guess you could say um because they did build roads everywhere they went to, to, to different extents and you know we have obviously in britain it's maybe not doesn't look as exciting but we've got the sweet track we've got this amazing you know wooden yeah. walkway and again it's through wetlands and it's connecting up islands for you to use yeah. islands so so you know whether that's because they're just good places for you know from a resource perspective or they're a bit more protected you know um i mean we know with the sweet track they're they're hurting animals along it because we've got you know animal dung and things like that but they're oh, also I using didn't it for, know for that, Jen. i didn't know that yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're probably bringing cows along along the sweet track as they not move easy. around. So it's, it's probably... Not easy. It's, it's only a couple well, no, of they're probably, 
they're probably walking in the the marshland themselves because it's oh, it would have yeah. been that that oh, deep, I see. you know yeah, at a certain so... point so maybe like summer pasture pasture land or you know yeah. probably not necessarily on the on the wood but yeah. you know and i was i was up also on the ridgeway the other week and obviously oh, the, yeah. the ridgeway you know people debate about the the sort of age of that but certainly some sections would have been possibly going back to maybe the neolithic oh, um yeah. you know so yeah. it you know people ha kind of had to get around during these periods and so it's extraordinary but it's also kind of it, it goes back to that point that i think i always like to make is they're they're just like us you know they're they're really different yeah. too but they're also just like us you know they have these practical needs that you know they need to get places and do their things and it's great yeah. to find evidence yeah. of it well yeah. uh, talking of practical needs um uh, copper <laughs> how about that um uh, and this is one, one again it's uh not a huge talking point, but uh, again, we're talking about connections. We're talking about you know what people needed in, in order, and this particularly is a is about uh, connections in uh, prehistoric uh, Europe. So, in brief, using um, access to about forty five uh, copper artifacts uh, from. Um, um, the middle of the fourth, uh, from the fourth and third millennium BC, um, uh, of also, uh, uh, axes, chisels, and other items, they've been able to discern the sh shifting patterns of um, uh, shifting networks uh, of trade of co copper items, and no great surprises uh, within it. Um, apparently, uh, the, the uh, data indicates that artifacts from, that from before 3500 BC uh, derived exclusively from mines in southeast Europe, and especially uh, the Serbian mining areas, uh, while later artifacts include ones from the eastern Alps and the Slovak mountains, and then much later, only much later, potentially the British Isles. Um, and uh, it says their results also indicate fluctuations in metallurgic activity over time, including a decrease in the prevalence of copper artifacts around uh, 3000 uh, BC. Um, so, what is, what is it? I mean, it's just another article, or just another study that uh, emphasizes. It's a can of worms. It's a can of worms. Yeah. We, we, we can be very brief about it here because yeah. uh, one of the things, you know, folks, I and mean, one of the things that excites us anyway is when you have lab techniques where they can analyze isotopes of whatever and tell you where it came from. And the fact that we now know that copper was coming from here first, then here, then here that the number one, the moving trade routes, the fact that we know that these people were connecting, whether it was by sea or, or whether the trading was done across land, you know, we, we don't know that yet, other than the places where they found ingots at the bottom of the sea, like they've done off the coast of Greece and uh, uh, Israel as well, in Israel, um, that they found copper and tin that came from Cornwall in these places. Uh, it's just something that really illustrates just how much people were uh, connecting. Uh, you know, it's it, it it raises so many evocative things. So if you're talking about this, particularly when something gets found at the bottom of the sea, and we know, for example, at Boldner Cliffs off the north coast of the Isle of Wight, which is a little island off the south coast of Britain, uh, that they found a Mesolithic boat uh, building workshop, if you like. And uh, the thing is, it's Mesolithic. And if you're building boats at sea, which, uh, you know, you, you're taking boats for any of this trading, you're at sea. Well, that means they might have had pontoons. Uh, you know, if you're if you're taking all sorts of stuff onto a boat, when you know how much are getting in a 
any kind of coracle sort of boat can overturn if you're not uh, really savvy at what you're doing. It's the fact that there's all sorts of seamanship that is being illustrated by these findings that makes you question all sorts of things about what might have been going on in coastal regions, you know, and it's that. There's just so much to learn from this stuff, and it's exciting every time they find something new like this. Big trade route. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, the, yeah. the, this network, you know, of copper trade, um, obviously things of value were going, going about. Um, but you're talking about the Mesolithic thing, Bolden the Cliff, and the, mm. you know, the, 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 we're also beginning to get the impression that Mesolithic peoples, the people we call hunter gatherers, uh, were so much more sophisticated. Uh, you know, they may have not been relying on farming for their basic things, and they may have had to have moved about a bit to to subsist. But on the other hand, they were still pretty savvy and and trading stuff when they could and establishing their own networks. Uh, mm. Across sea, etc. Et uh, we're going to do yeah. a, a special sometime very soon, Rupert and I, uh, about how we misconceive the term hunter gatherer and how we misconceive yeah. the people that that yeah. term. Uh, it, it's quite funny how people get quite angry with us, uh, you know, when we talk about hunter gatherers. Oh, yeah gatherers having built whatever you know Gobekli Tepe um, and people say don't be stupid hunter gatherers can't possibly have built uh, this and you say but it just means that they weren't farmers oh, yeah. you know uh, uh, and and in actual fact the hunter gatherer lifestyle is a darn sight easier than the farming one they'd have had much more time on their time. hands particularly yeah. if you've got a herd of goats or a herd of cow uh, you know uh, that uh, that you, you're just dragging around the place farming oh, God, farming shockingly difficult if you haven't got a population of thousands you don't need farming so yeah they were very sophisticated people and i just I think, I think the, Ange, sorry, Jennifer. i'm gonna say hi to Ange because it's her first time in the chat oh hello, hello Ange. Ange. <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> welcome to you i, I was uh, just sorry. gonna say i think that the fuzziness of those lines are 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 real like the line between sort of farmer hunter gatherer are becoming yeah. so fuzzy and if you think back years ago it was so kind of distinct and and even in british prehistory i mean one of the things that i really like one of the things i really became fascinated with with doing the world of stonehenge exhibition was looking at how much the kind of hunter gatherers really influenced those first farmers you know and and you know if you think about it the first farmer you know the farmers that came over from france they were in they, there was a thousand years between when they were in France, by the time they got really and got established in Britain, what was mm -hmm. going on there? You, there was no communication back and forth. And mm. I mean, and there is actually a couple of fair, relatively new articles, which I have to admit, I have not yet read, um, that are discussing this, that there were probably a much closer connection between these, these kind of communities. It's just that, that obviously the hunter gatherers, they had such smaller groups of people that, you know, they kind of did die out because there wasn't that many of them in a way, but, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean their legacy is completely died out. And so many places that gained significance in the Neolithic were significant mm -hmm. in the Mesolithic period already. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think, mm -hmm. and, and also the way they shaped some of the land is just really fascinating. So I agree with you. Yeah. I think it's such a fascinating topic. And I think the more we study it going forward, it's going to become more and more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agreed. Yeah. Totally agreed. I'll, I'll I just, uh, use Marco's comment actually to expand upon that. So Marco says there's evidence that 4,200 BC there were sailing ships and boats in uh, Iberia. Yeah, it mm. doesn't su surprise uh, at all. But I think yeah. even earlier than that, and you could argue that um, without a pre-established Mesolithic hunter-gatherer trade network in the Aegean, that mm. the 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 Turkey that uh, Anatol the farmers already established in Anatolia would not necessarily have been a, attracted across the sea, uh, uh, you know, across to the Cyclades and across to uh, um, Greece. Um, but that's another story. I think we should uh, uh, move on. It's Got slightly off topic story. there. Yeah. But, uh, who, who knew that uh, would ever possibly yeah. happen? Uh, I'm just going to acknowledge Stuart's comment on desert kites. Yeah, absolutely quite right. You know, uh, that's uh, uh, herding right there. Yeah. 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 
Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> uh, Rupert, you, you, uh, would you like to uh, take this one if I put it on, up on the screen? Um, um, mummies provide the key to reconstruct the climate of the ancient <laughs> Mediterranean. Yes. Yeah. Do you know what? What, what attracted uh, the, you to this one? I'll tell you what attracted me to this. It's because uh, it, it, it's another simple thing about a scientist somewhere just had this brilliant idea um and that's the egyptian mummies you know we just think of them as uh, as wrapped up corpses um but they were quite understandably when you think about it they were all tagged um because once a body is wrapped up then obviously it's in, unless you've labeled it well how easy it would be to uh, mistake one body for another so uh, they had tags tied to them so you wouldn't confuse them and these tags were made of wood and somebody had the bright idea of saying well hold on <laughs> this, this is wood this is trees if we analyze these properly we'd be able to tell you what the climate was like at the time and that's entirely what they've done it's just they have taken name tags of dead bodies and they are reconstructing the climate at the time from the dendrochronology that they're matching uh, for the uh, for the pieces of wood uh, yeah. that the labels were made from, I just think that that is brilliant science right there. Somebody just having a completely left field idea, you know, completely unrelated in its way to uh, to what the tags are actually about. I just I love it when somebody has that kind of left field thinking i loved it yeah. that's the only reason i wanted to flag it up and talk about it mm -hmm. um mummies uh, we're still talking about post are we talking about post dynastic uh, egypt yeah this these is, these are late yeah. these are late yeah. these, yeah. Are, these, these are, are roman only, roman uh, monies yeah yeah um uh so uh, uh but uh, uh, but that in itself is academic uh really um it, it, i mean there are so many things that we could say about brilliant idea isn't it <laughs> yeah it's totally that totally that um uh yeah. I, you know what i mean when you when you think we were talking earlier on about um uh, about the Rosetta stone and uh, and talking about cleopatra in passing so that's kind of concurrent uh with these mummies and it's something else that I find really, really evocative is that when Cleopatra was ruling Egypt, the pyramids were already ancient. They were a couple of thousand years and more old already. And people were going to Egypt as tourists to look at these ancient sites. You know, and I think that's the kind of thing it's really important important to put these things in perspective you know that they mm -hmm. uh, they were in place uh, okay their civilization uh, did change over time with dynastic and pre-dynastic uh, um, uh, culture but nevertheless the Egyptians were there you know how long has has our Western civilization been around as we know it not very long they were there an awful lot longer than us. And I just, I love the fact that it would have been Egyptian archaeologists that were looking at the pyramids. I love that. <laughs> just love it. <laughs> yeah. I, well, well said. As uh, Nadia says, it was longer between the pyramids and Caesar yeah. than Caesar and there. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, have, you... I often have, have a similar argument about the, the kind of quote unquote Stone Age. It's like, we're closer to the people who built Stonehenge than they were to sort of, you know, the people of, of the Ice Age or, you know, yeah, yeah. it's it's a really interesting thought and in the way also we just construct our time periods and stuff. But I, I think the really wonderful thing about, about the organics, beyond the fact that Egypt's one of the few places in the world where you really get all these organic, you know, things preserved and, you know, in a, in a really great form, is that just like, the fact that you can get these ex very explicit information and these very explicit dates, which were so lacking so much <laughs> of the time. And, and I always think about, I always think about Seahenge, like that's my favorite yeah. one because, because they were able to do this kind of dendrochronology and, 
you know, and we, because of that, we know it was this, you know, this tree, this massive tree and the circle was put up, you know, the spring of, or summer of 2049 BC specifically. And you're like, you can think back to that year, that moment. So like right now we are, you know, <laughs> 4,000 years ago, someone in, yeah. in Norfolk was putting up yeah. this, this strange circle of, yeah. of you know, yeah. so it does yeah. give you again, that kind of that little snapshot, you know, into the past, yeah. you know, to a past moment. Yeah. I love the fact that there are all these little bits and pieces that, uh, that just, that, 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 they just don't seem to fit together when you talk about them. And it's the fact that I love the fact that there were still mammoths on Wrangell Island, the, the, the last stronghold, if you like, before mammoths became extinct. Uh, there were still mammoths on Wrangell Island when they were building the pyramids. Uh, <laughs> you know, people imagine that they wow. disappeared completely in the Ice Age. No, they didn't. They clung on. <laughs> they clung on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just little things like that. I think it just it turns your... Uh, you know, th these images that you have in your head from when you were at school or whatever, you know, that these generalizations mm -hmm. that we learn. And uh, and sometimes it's never as straightforward as that. Yeah. Well said, mm. folks. Um, very good. Uh, we're going back to, well, long distance networks now uh, with Bronze Age long distance connections, Baltic yes. Amber in Ashur. That probably means nothing except when you realize that in Ashur is in present day Iraq, is it not? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and we do love amber, don't we? Um, yeah, show us your well, necklace again almost as much as obsidian. <laughs> well, do you know what? I, I wouldn't want to wear obsidian. Oh, no, maybe I would. Um, no, but. I, I was showing Mike some of these earlier on. I, I've got a big collection of amber, and uh, all, uh, uh, nearly all my. Up. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold uh, on. Well, I, you can do. Um, I've got. Go. Uh, I've got an awful lot of bits of amber. Oh, down, uh, and uh, most of it has got insects in it that, uh, that some of them are too small to see, but uh, but also interesting thing. Look at this. I've got loads of raw bits of amber that aren't polished. That uh, you know, yeah. it, it looks. There we go. Light it, it looks like touch nothing. Of paper, he's off. <laughs> yeah. I, well, and also, the sad, <laughs> well, sorry, the I can't help thing, it. I, it it degrades because it is porous. It degrades over time. So sometimes yeah. archaeologically, we don't always see the beauty of it. I've so, got fungus yeah, nets. Wow. On these. Um, anyway, yeah, <laughs> I can't do it. I've got tons of the stuff. Um, <laughs> but it was. I tell you, I found really exciting thing about this. <laughs> And I'm going off on one. It's just that this amber that was found in Iraq, it's Baltic amber. Mm -hmm. And most of the Baltic yeah. amber is about 55 million years old, right? And my collection of amber is also <laughs> Baltic amber. And and I just love the idea that, you don't know, this stuff gets broken up, it gets washed down beaches and all the rest of it, that I could have some amber in that bowl there that might have come off the same tree that one of those bits in Iraq uh, uh, came <laughs> off. I know it probably didn't, but it could have done. Um, I just, do you know, oh, just reverie. Uh. I'm, I'm actually wearing an amber necklace. It's hard to see, but it's dark oh, yeah. amber that when it, when the sap formed on the tree, it, it actually incorporated moss. So it's like this special oh. type of amber that is a mossy. And it's from a shop. There's a place in Norwich that has a it's it's a jewelry shop. But it has a amber collection that is the biggest second second biggest in Britain after the Natural History Museum. In Norwich. In Norwich, yeah. I'll have to look and that up. So they have. You're gonna have to look it up. <laughs> you, you definitely need to make friends with this person. But um, the amber is 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 fascinating because it is that it's like the the. It, you know, especially when, once we hit the Bronze Age, it's up there with gold as like the representative material of the sun. Like mm. I, I saw someone in the chat, Carrie put frozen drops of honey. And I think that's a really good description, but also frozen yeah. drops almost of like the sun, you know, which chunks of gold looks like too. And um, I, I, I don't know if you, you must've featured this story maybe a year or so ago when they were talking about um, Bush Barrow, the, the dagger, um, you know, the dagger handle from Bush Barrow and how it had a similar gold working technique to what they were finding in Mycenae in some of the burials there yeah. and about this long distance trade. And this would have been a very similar period of time. Um, 
And, but they, in that talk, the authors were saying that they think the amber was the basis for that Mediterranean to Northern Europe trade. That was the really the key thing. And then obviously other things went along yeah. those routes. So again, you get those really crazy long distance. But to think about going all the way to Iraq is pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, the it's, astonishing thing, of course, is, is that um, we're sort of being blasé about this uh, now, you know, having covered so many other techniques and <laughs> uh, studies that linking uh, um, far-flung places uh, together. Um, I just thought, bring us back to reality and say we're talking about Fourier transform infrared spectrum spectroscopy here <laughs> yes we are better known as ftir <laughs> uh, so to yeah. be able to establish that this uh, from only two items it seems that were found uh, in actually in 1914 under the great ziggurat mm -hmm. of uh, ashur um <laughs> have only been now put to this uh, test uh, to discover that uh, it aligns with um, stuff all the way from the Baltic. And of course, just to underline it, um, the uh, foundation, the deposit uh, dated from around uh, 1800 to uh, 1750 uh, BC. Uh, and of course, ziggurats, we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the great um, <coughs> Tigris, Euphrates, um, proto-cities and cities here. Mm -hmm. uh, not so long ago, we were talking about Lagash, which I think, which uh, Ashur was one of the uh, uh, city-states that they were, they were in, in yeah. conflict with each other all that time ago. Yeah. Beer in Lagash. Indeed, yeah. So I, I don't think there's anything much there just to underline people were going mm. places again. Yeah. And science yeah. is doing stuff. That's the head. Yeah. Do you know, I, I, I love the fact that, uh, that uh, these new techniques means that, that people in museums can, can go back to old collections and come out with a completely new set of knowledge from something that's been in a collection for a century or more, you know. Uh, Lily's made a comment here, which I really like, that she says it, that talking of mummies reminded me that I felt aghast when I heard that many were ground up for paint. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, that is, it's true. They used to grind up mummies uh, for um, paint pigments, which sounds a little bit weird, but they did. They did that a lot. And she makes a point that that means that they're still around in paintings, and that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that gives you a completely different kind of immortality, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Bertie asks, is there a prehistoric use of amber? No. Um, as as jewellery and as decoration. Uh, well, but not, no, um, as, a, as a utility, I think that's what uh, uh, Bertie knows. Mm. There is... I can't think of anything. Can you think of anything? They have... Amber has some interesting qualities that I think um, it can, if you hit it against each other, it can kind of... It has a bit of it can create a spark and things like that oh, so might have yeah. almost had like I, that's not necessarily a practical quality but it might have had a kind of magical, magical quality spark? because of i think so um, really it's a resin how can you spark it? you've got okay, come well, on you've got two bits i know I've got, <laughs> I've got lots of bits but should i be doing it with polished or unpolished my guess um, would be polished. <laughs> that's not gonna no i'm just breaking it um Sorry. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and folks, I will report back after I've destroyed yes. some of my amber. I will. I will try to see if I can find the source for that. I I could be getting confused with a different. Yeah. I'd be um, interested if you could. Uh, you certainly can with quartz, but um, yeah. As, yeah. No, it's um, it's definitely if it's not. Helen it might says, be. Yeah. yeah, it's not quartz, um, but I think there's something about that. But I don't know if it has any other kind of specific. I mean, it is interesting because you obviously can burn amber resins. So, yeah. um, mm. uh, I don't... says amber has been used a lot thousands of years ago. In German, it is called Bernstein, stone, yeah. which translates to burning stone. Okay, cool. Right. And as Carrie says, it's the uh, crystal uh, structure. Oh, okay. All right. Crystal structure of amber. Yeah. It doesn't have a crystal structure. <laughs> It has just have gone you, 10 o'clock. Have you had Alison Sheridan on here? 
Oh yes, think... yes, more than, more than once. <laughs> I was going to say, if you want, if you want all the Amber insights, she's the one to talk to. <laughs> oh, she you know knows what? everything uh, about uh, Amber as well as everything else, does she? <laughs> yes, and uh, everything Alice else. But is uh, she's really quite extraordinary, <laughs> isn't she? Uh, yes, she's a good friend, and uh, we do mm. drag her on uh, periodically. Um, yeah. yeah, what doesn't that woman know? She's quite. A, she, she is a tour de force. <laughs> she certainly is. She is a tour de force, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, Helen asks, "Was there an amber bead with uh, Amesbury Archer?" I do believe there was, but it, I mean, amber beads mm. is an interesting thing. They are very, quite common in uh, engraved goods um, all over the place. And the bron um, early Bronze Age, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. And uh, a bead is not necessarily a bead in this case because it has been um, put to us, and that uh, the often they'd be uh, the tie, uh, ties. What do you call them? Still a bead, isn't it? But on Still the drawstring a bead, of, a, of a shroud. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. that was something that uh, I, I can't speak for Michael here. I felt a bit of an idiot um, because when we made, uh, and some of you will probably have seen, we made a film uh, called Dolmens, Dolmens of the Longer Dog, Dog. Uh, which is all down mm. here. And, um, and one of the things that came up fairly frequently was a single amber bead being found in a burial. And... Uh, and so I, I was thinking about it in some sort of, you know, there, there's something enigmatic here about the relevance of a single amber bead. Why would you give someone or bury somebody with a single amber bead? And it's, and it was Duncan um, who okay. who said to us uh, that um, uh, that yeah, well, there's a drawstring on a whether it was a shroud or whether it was a little bag that that you know. That some trinkets that you you put in the grave with the uh, with the the deceased, uh, and it was the drawstring. So everything else, you know, the 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 bag or the shroud or the string, that's all long since decayed away. You're just yeah. left with the bead. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was um, yeah, that was a sudden slap in the face of um, of real <laughs> yeah realization. <laughs> Yeah, no, you were being stupid, Soskin. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's not, it's sometimes not, hard to to picture these things because we have so much. I mean, all the organic record is so you know it doesn't survive most of the time. And but I think mm. there and there is that significance. Is that do you I of, you often think like did this one bead did it get taken off of someone's necklace and then put onto that burial shroud as a kind mm. of significant mm. offering? Because obviously yeah. they, these would have been significant things. So, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting. <clears throat> I think we I would like to see your evening. amber necklace up close. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I'm just really interested in mossy amber. It just it must be yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I will Carrie send. I will asked. send you a photo. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Carrie asked, uh, "How does it feel to the skin? Cool, warm, etc. It feels warm." Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, actually um, quite it's, soft and warm. It has yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not cold. It's kind of kind of I don't know. It's quite delicate <clears throat> in some ways. Yeah. Guys, it is uh, well past 10 o'clock um and uh, I don't want to test uh, the uh, um <laughs> the patience or the uh, uh stamina of our viewers too much. So maybe we should think about bringing this evening to a close, but not before. Bring... <laughs> uh, not before we're back uh, back in the Middle East again. Uh, and yes. humanity's uh, earliest recorded kiss occurred in Mesopotamia 4,500 years ago. Claims we should a say study. Go yes, on, we should that's... say up front. Well, no, this is this is the whimsy section. We don't have it every month, but we have whimsy section. When we find something that we think is stupid, we'll tell you so. And uh, there's a number of the articles <laughs> that are reporting this uh, that right. are actually reporting it as... Uh, as, if. as Well, it, it certainly is the first recorded kiss, uh, the first recorded kiss. Um, yeah. But some of them and are it's recording it... not that it... plaque. That's just a, an illustrative... Um... Yes. Yeah, that's uh, um, irrelevant to this. So uh, that's just uh, illustrative. Um, but some of them are saying that uh, that this four and a half thousand year old representation from Mesopotamia is evidence of 
uh, humans really, it was when humans first started getting face kissing together or mouth kissing together. And we just thought, for crying out loud, this <laughs> this research was paid for. Um, and, and I thought, well, that's a waste of public money. Um, and what an idiotic thing to say. So, uh, so we just uh, uh, were thinking, well, how can we uh, show that, apart from anything else, you take animals like wolves, for example, that well, they stick their tongues in each other's uh, mouths uh, as a, a greeting. And in fact, if you ever go and meet wolves uh, on any of these trips that you can do where you meet wolves, they will stick their tongue in your mouth to say hello as well. Um, so, uh, so, so, but, but just to, to, to outline, uh, without, is, is this a personal experience, Rupert? <laughs> hey, it's rude not to. <laughs> <laughs> but w without reading through the article itself, it's just worthwhile sort of pointing out the uh, there's a kind of discrepancy in it while it's trying to point to the earliest kissing uh, and points out studies that used to say that the earliest kissing was 3,500 years ago cause, and it may have led to herpes outbreak mm. then, and then <laughs> saying, well, no, it's 4,000, according to these cuneiform uh, tablets, no, it's 4,500 years old. And throughout all these articles, the underlying implication is that kissing started 4,500 <laughs> years ago. Um, and the, the, it's the, ridiculous. The, artic the articles are not sort of self-conscious about um, really. It's, just, it's painful journalism, is what it is. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, this, uh, this yeah. reminds but, uh, me. Do you remember that article that they had about a year ago? About it was a sim It was a very similar article, and I'm I'm looking at it in the Guardian. Modern herpes variants may be linked to Bronze Age kissing study finds. <laughs> Well, I think that's it the basically one, says yeah. exactly the same thing 4,500 years ago. Oh, it's those yeah. bloody Bronze Age migrants. They spread, <laughs> you know, they were yes. obviously obsessed with kissing Let's... and spread Bronze. it all over Europe. Yeah. <laughs> started having sex for cra Oh, dear. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, Shocking. Well, yeah. Can we just uh, underline it for a moment with a series of images that may just uh, uh, underline... <laughs> our incredulity at this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we need to say anything? Oh, there's your pals. <laughs> well, anybody yeah. that's owned a, a, a dog will know, you know. Yeah. Uh, how about that? Aww. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. Just cute. <laughs> I, I, how, how long did you spend researching animal kissing? Uh, honestly, five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. This is, uh, that's this easy is lovely. Um, I think this should have been yeah. safe for Valentine's Day, this story. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. I think yeah, we've made our go. point about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching. What can folks. we say? Uh, we'll Jennifer, say thank, thank you, you so much for spending the evening with us. Um, yeah. We do like your company. Thank you. Um, yeah. No, it's been, it's been, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, um, great. Yeah. And, uh, and we will be uh, coming back to you with, with many questions as they arise yeah, as we, we <laughs> certainly, you know, around uh, Gebekli Tepe and, you know, uh, and maybe, um, you know, around particular things uh, around uh, Grimes Graves or, or, or Thornborough Henges mm -hmm. or even Stonehenge itself. Uh, who's known? Who knows mm -hmm. if we're going to be doing particular um, uh, things? Uh, we'd love to, you know, have you on and have your wisdom. Uh, <clears throat> yes. No, I'd love um, to. to share. And we're gonna we'll get you we'll get you down that those mine shafts. We have a live. Oh, we're looking forward there. to it already. Well, yeah, I'm, no, we're, 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 <laughs> I'm thinking there's no reason why they shouldn't, and every reason why they should be part of Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge. Yep, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you everybody for uh, for watching. You've been uh, you've been great with your input and. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah, stamina, as I said earlier. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, it's been a, a fascinating evening, fascinating uh, talking with that. Uh, I think it's uh, bye bye from me. Uh, and a bye bye from me. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Lovely to to see you all. And <laughs> this is this is so I'm going to do very serious two days of archaeology conferences. You know, oh yes, Europa good luck with that. Prehistoric Society conference. So this has actually probably brightened my mood <laughs> the night before. So <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> well, well in, cool. enjoy the conference. We can we can ask you how it went uh, after the weekend. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Good stuff. All right then. Well, uh, take care, everybody. And a slug herpes. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, um, yeah, we'll we'll see you again uh, very soon. Um, uh, patron folks uh, watching, don't forget that the next uh, Patreon live uh, show is next Tuesday. So we'll see yeah. you then. Till then, bye bye. <laughs>